Number 10, Lasher. Lasher is one of the symbiotes that Venom was forced to give birth to by the Life Foundation, who kidnapped the symbiote in order to make Venom make more symbiotes for them. Which is really messed up and explains why the Venom symbiote was so apprehensive when it was pregnant following its experience with the Life Foundation. Each symbiote that it gave birth to with the Life Foundation seemed to have its own special powers, and Lasher's was that they could remote control from a distance a non sentient host in addition to their main one. Using this other host, is a form of reconnaissance or like a scout or simply to just be in two places at once which is pretty cool i've always wanted to be able to be in multiple places at once i could get so many things done number nine dylan Dylan might not initially seem like a child of Venom, but in a way he is. In fact, it's even been suggested that he might actually be a part of Venom, a piece of the symbiote broken off and molded into something new, or at the very least, blended with something new. Venom was a genetic contributor at the time of Dylan's conception, as Anne Wang, his mother, was bonded with the Venom symbiote when she became pregnant with Dylan. Dylan is therefore kind of like Eddie's, Anne's, and Venom's child all together. Dylan initially demonstrated power which allowed him to control and bend symbiotes to his will, in addition to repelling and resisting them if they wanted to bond to him and he didn't want to. This made him insanely powerful. However, during the King in Black event, he lost this power, which it turns out was attached to the God of Light, when his father Eddie Brock destroyed Null, who was attempting to take hold of Dylan's body via the living abyss inside him. As it stands now, Dylan is bonded with the Venom symbiote, which grants him some power, but he is also still very new to this whole thing. Meaning he's not particularly skilled or really powerful just yet, which is why I ranked him so low. So low, low, despite his cool powers he once had that were pretty unique. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Venom lists, you want to learn about more of the Venom family, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight. Riot. Riot is also known as being one of the strongest symbiotes to have come from the ones Venom gave birth to while being kept prisoner by the Life Foundation. Riot is often suggested to be the strongest of the litter, at least the physically strongest. He is the most buff of the litter. And he has also been referred to as Mr. Riot, which is a name I honestly love a lot. Because of Riot's inherent super strength, the symbiote generally prefers to use its tendrils to create blunt force weapons, which it can then use in combat against its opponents or to brute strength force its way through any obstacles in its path. Riot Smash. Mr. Riot Smash. Number 7. Spider-Man Rain. 35 years have passed. Spider-Man is an old, retired man. Mary Jane Watson has passed away. New York is under the control of dictator Mayor Waters and his police force called Rain. But unbeknownst to most, it was Venom who had been pulling the strings, taking the position of aide to the mayor in the body of Edward Sachs. This version of Venom is much more brooding, maniacal, and downright dastardly than his mainline counterpart, plotting, scheming for the eventual return of his rival. He's a bitter old symbiote since Spider-Man retired, feeling abandoned by the hero and cannot wait to get his hands back on him. He has replicated himself thousands of times, put together the Sinister Six, and has trapped the citizens of New York in the city with his security system known as Web. That's W-E-B-B. -B. All that, and he is still defeated by the end of the comic. Shame. Number six, Agent Venom. Flash Thompson. The bully to Peter Parker and unknowingly his high school number one fan. After he goes off to the army and loses both of his legs, he joins up with a secret government program, Project Rebirth 2.0, that sees him bond with the Venom symbiote to become Agent Venom, a symbiote super soldier who set off on his own as a hero. Joining the Secret Avengers, the Guardians of the Galaxy, Thunderbolts, and fighting in lots and lots of stories before he lost the symbiote and eventually became Agent Anti-Venom. With the symbiote, Flash gets the superhero starter pack of powers, plus those awarded to hosts of symbiotes. So that's wall crawling, web generation, spider sense, plus invulnerability to spider sense, invisibility, symbiote tendrils, and shape shifting, and hive mind, and all that extra good stuff. But being a soldier, he is also extremely adept with weapons. He's an awesome fan favorite character, just like the original Venom, giving him a whole ton of the power of popularity. Number five. Venom 2099. The Earth of Spider-Man 2099 is pretty awesome. Cyberpunk themes, President Doom, a seriously flawed Miguel O'Hara as Spider-Man with that awesome suit. It shouldn't be any surprise that the Venom of 2099 is just as awesome and 
pretty terrifying. The Venom symbiote in this world has been around for a long time. Like, long enough even to have evolved to have new abilities. Really cool stuff, like acid blood and spit. This version of the symbiote bonded itself to Kron Stone, the son of Tyler Stone and the elder half-brother of Miguel O'Hara. Kind of confusing. The symbiote first appears when it tries to de life Tyler in the hospital, and that is when Spider Man intervenes. The fight goes on for a long time, like, like several issues long, with Venom making Spider Man choose between his two loves and even de lifing Spider Man's former lover, Dana. After Miguel learned of Venom's weakness to sound, sonic sounds were emitted all over the city, stunning Venom and allowing Spider Man to beat him. Later, the symbiote would emerge with Roman the Submariner and flee into the ocean. But this version of the Black Goop really had some power, not to mention some anger issues. He was a true antithesis to Spider Man, as Venom should be. Number four. Host Rider. Ooh, wordplay. Well done. And also an extremely cool looking character with a Venom twist. Only it starts to make a little less sense the more you think about it. This Ghost Rider is actually Robbie Reyes, who if you don't know isn't actually the spirit of vengeance. He's actually the spirit of his uncle who seems to have completely taken over his body. And somewhere along the line, we're not told when, the Venom symbiote bonded with them creating this almost perfect chaotic parasitic being, basically just using the body of Robbie Reyes. Now like I said, it kind of makes no sense. Ghost Rider is literally hellfire and symbiotes are weak to fire, but I don't think anyone is really complaining. This guy is brutal. He dispatches shield agents with ease and he feeds the Calvin Zabo of his universe to his car. His car eats people! Come on! It is cool and terrifying all at the same time. This host rider has an ability called the Penance Kiss, which is very much like the Penance Stare, only with the mouth. Determining people's guilt or innocence and then pretty much consuming their soul. I can't help but imagine what his voice sounds like. It's probably really cool. He's brutal, he's ruthless, he looks amazing, he's covered in fire, and they are host rider. Number three, May Parker Venom, Earth X. Earth 999, a world where basically every single person has powers, except things have gone apocalyptic, and where the daughter of Peter Parker, May Parker, is Venom. While her retired and cynical pops ain't too thrilled about it, she does actually have complete control over the symbiote thanks to her advanced and honed spider sense. She was eventually under the control of this kid, going by the Red Skull name, and thanks to her father and other Earth X classic heroes, was saved. With Venom and her father Spider Man going on to join the super powered police force and fight crime and supervillain threats together. She eventually, after the death of of, well, death, was recruited by Kang the Conqueror as a multiversal team to fight the Apocalypse Twins. In addition to her proportional spider powers, plus the enhanced spider sense, she gains all the usual symbiote powers, plus a few extra, like what seems to be a rudimentary form of telepathy. And tis believed her symbiote could go on to mutate further to gain more powers, which is a good way for Marvel to say, we can do whatever we want with this. She is definitely one of the cooler incarnations of Venom, as are most characters on the Earth X world. Not a Venom, of their own perspective characters. You know what I meant. Number two, Barbarian Venom. Okay, he's not a barbarian really. But in the War of the Realms, Eddie no longer has the symbiote Venom. He fights as best as he can against the Dark Elves on his own. A War Witch sees his awesomeness and bestows a Dream Stone to him that will give him anything he wants. Now using this Dream Stone, he is imbued with all the powers of the Venom symbiote, but just quite a bit stronger and with Eddie's complete control. But feeding on his rage, which he shows us when he completely cuts off the arm of the really powerful war witch and takes on a full force of giants and ogres and trolls and dark elves and a whole bunch of other stuff. But then he faces off against Jack O'Lantern, also boosted up by another dreamstone. While this fire based villain would be a problem for Venom, Eddie gets this stone looking armor stuff. And this is where we get the Viking barbarian looking Venom. Because he literally looks like a barbarian with a crazy horned helmet with a big axe with all these runes and he's just so badass. He completely unlocks the seemingly unlimited amount of power from this dreamstone, just going to town and he even bonds the symbiote to civilians who join in the fight against the dark elves. Eddie literally calls down lightning on Jack O' Lantern. He's wild. And eventually this dreamstone symbiote thing corrupts him a little bit and he gives it up, but damn, I love this story. Check it out. Number one, Gwenum. Ooh, more wordplay. 
even nicer. But she hasn't just got wordplay on her side. No, Spider Gwen of Earth 65 or Ghost Spider, which is way better, has easily one of the best costumes of all the spider heroes. Throw in a healthy dash of a symbiotic monster from outer space, notorious for giving great fashion advice, and well, look at her. She's absolutely amazing. On top of that, Gwen sort of relies on Venom for her powers since her original powers started to fade. But while that sounds bad, Gwen has actually learned to find a very healthy balance with her symbiote. The symbiote itself enhances whatever emotions the host has, right? So when she first bonded with Venom, thanks to a corrupt Matt Murdock kingpin who she was forced to team up with, she was rage fueled and looking for revenge against the rhino for attacking her father and eventually against Murdock himself. But over time, she realized that she needed to control that and give Venom better qualities to enhance in order to control and find balance with the symbiote. In a way, Venom actually helped her to become a better hero, all while still retaining that really, really sweet suit. Mwah. Chef's kiss, Gabella. Mwah. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Lee Price. Making his comic book debut as Venom in Volume 3, Lee Price had a pretty rough life, before the symbiote stuff even. He was bullied, his father was horrible to him and his mother, so he burned the place down to the ground. Which is not a great way of handling the situation, but comic books, you know, what are you gonna do? He blamed the fire on a mutant boy with pyrokinesis, and when he grew up, he suppressed all of it. He actually believed down the road that his father had abandoned him, and that the fire was actually caused by the mutant. He was in protective services after that point, and as an adult, he would join the army rangers, until he was injured in a mine explosion, which in turn left him without a few squad members and a few fingers. Discharged and left without any benefits, Lee had no choice but to accept a job from Matt Gargan to be a tough guy while the deal goes down between Black Cat's gang and Tombstone's gang. That's when he found the symbiote, or rather, the symbiote found him. Number nine, Ultimate Venom. Venom of Earth 1610, aka the Ultimate Universe, made his first appearance at Ultimate Spider-Man 33. Now the Ultimates are great for the most part. We see these major changes to the heroes we thought we knew, like Thor, for example, isn't a god this time around. Gwen becomes Carnage, and Wanda and her bro, they're close, they're closer than the other version, that's for sure. In this tale, Richard Parker and Eddie Brock Sr. were working together to develop a way to heal humanity. The symbiotic biosuit named Project Venom was underway. <clears throat> the project was adding up to be more than a two-man job, so they partnered up with Trask Industries for some help. The company eventually realized the potential of the symbiote and figured, eh, let's just use it as a bioweapon and create super soldiers. Sounds good, let's do it. That ought to do something, right? Well, it did do something. When Richard and Eddie were on a plane to fight Trask in court, see, they had secretly created their own version and wanted to pull it out to prove ownership. But Eddie pulled the suit out a little bit too early while they were still flying, and that's how they all perished in the Ultimate Universe. As a student, Eddie Jr. began studying a sample of that same Venom project with Dr. Kurt Connors, and Peter took a piece to study himself. After Peter spilled a drop on his hand, he got the black suit makeover, cranking his powers up to 10. He was now on Touchable, but when a robber shot another man, this triggered Peter. It reminded him of his Uncle Ben and what happened, so he went full Venom. He made an absolute mess. He lost his symbiote after getting entangled in electric cables on purpose. He wanted this thing to go. The only parts left were in his bloodstream, and also that other sample left at the lab, which yes, Eddie Jr. ended up finding. And before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it, if not, still give it a thumbs up and still give us more chances. I don't know, back to the list. Number eight, Demon. Coming in hot from Earth 5101, Pavatar Prabhakar made his first appearance in Spider-Man India, issue one. Pavatar moved to Mumbai with his Aunt Maya and Uncle Bim to continue studying. He got half a scholarship and was determined to keep the success train going. His best and only friend, MJ, Mira Jane, stood by his side all the while. He got his powers through an ancient ritual, which in my opinion is way cooler than a spider biting your hand mid-photo, you know? Nalan Oberoi, a crime lord of this alternate reality, used an amulet to get himself possessed by a demon. That demon was determined to hold a door open for other demonic forces. Pavatar, while being chased by bullies, ran into an ancient yogi who then gave him the powers of a spider. Which sounds great, but when you find out that this reality's venom is a century-old demon stuck in an amulet, you get a little bit nervous for him. Demon Venom was was freed by a cult called the Neo Alvers, and once he was free, nearby towns were just obliterated. You know the rest. He had us in the name Demon, let's be honest here. 
Number 7, Mania. Mania is a clone of Venom. Mania was actually created from a sample of Venom that had been acquired. However, that hasn't stopped the symbiote from taking on a life all its own as it's continued to evolve in the comics, acquiring new purposes and hosts along the way. The Mania symbiote was first created by the Ararat Corporation from a piece of Venom's tongue that they had harvested. It was intended to be used as a weapon to basically wipe out all life on the planet Earth, but this plan, well, it didn't didn't end up working out as they had hoped. And while initially the Mania symbiote became obsessed with feasting off of its victim's fear and literally eating people, it eventually found a stable host in Andy Benton, and even became a hero for a time. That is, before it was taken by the super sinister Lee Price, who himself was also one of the worst hosts the actual Venom symbiote ever had as well. Number 6, Venom 2099. Venom in the 2099 AD reality of Earth 928 is the brother of the Spider Man of that era, Spider Man 2099. Miguel O'Hara, Miguel's half brother, is named Cron Stone, and he is Miguel's brother through his birth father, Tyler Stone, the head of Alchemax's research and development division. However, Cron never knew that Miguel was his brother, although he pretty much always hated Miguel, so I'm pretty sure even learning this wouldn't really change much between the two. After being left to die by the Punisher of 2099, whose family Kron was responsible for taking out, Kron ended up bumping into the Venom symbiote, which had mutated over the years. The symbiote bonded to Kron, and together they became the villain known as Venom. Number 5, Legion. Legion is another version of Venom that ended up being assimilated by him. Yeah, symbiote alternates can be uh, kind of weird sometimes, to be honest. I mean, right now in the comics, we technically have a bunch of Venoms that are all Eddie, but they're all like from different points in his life, and it, it just. Symbiotes are weird. Legion was basically created by the maker and Eddie Brock, and was used to fight against Dark Carnage during the Absolute Carnage Venom-centric event. Dang, that was a fun event. Legion came to be thanks to a combination of codices which the maker was collecting on Earth-616 under the pretense of helping Venom to defeat Carnage. Now, in reality, the maker had his own plans for the collection of symbiote codices, which I don't think any of us are surprised by. However, those plans would not come to fruition as Eddie managed to bond with the maker's collection of codices in his fight against Dark Carnage, allowing him to defeat Carnage by summoning a Necro Sword to, well, defeat him. Following this, when he was once more bonded to the Venom symbiote, it absorbed the Legion symbiote into itself. So, no more Legion symbiote, but it did exist for a time. Number 4, MC2. In the MC2 reality, we get to explore a world where Peter Parker was allowed to actually grow up and settle down. He and Mary Jane end up having two children, May and Benji. If you are wondering what Venom is up to in this alternate future, the symbiote ends up separated from Eddie Brock and locked up for a long time. Now, when it finally breaks free, it seeks out Peter, looking to remain bonded to him. Venom intends on isolating Peter, leaving him with no one but the symbiote, and kind of also hopes to torment Peter as payback for his his rejection years prior. Venom as such intends to kill Peter's family while bonded with Peter so that he can make him watch. Fortunately, Peter's kids both end up with superpowers in this reality and his daughter, Spider Girl aka Mayday, ends up stopping Venom, saving the day as well as her entire family. Number 3, what if the alien costume had possessed Spider-Man? In What If issue number 4, we find out the answer to this question. Here, Peter didn't realize until it was too late what his black suit truly was. No longer able to seemingly separate from Venom, Peter remains stuck with the symbiote. Although he attempts to get help, Venom uses its camouflage powers to make them impossible to find, also taking control of Peter whenever he attempts to actually like reach out and contact Black Cat to get help. When Venom does end up in a battle with the other heroes, Heroes, the symbiote actually chooses to jump ship to Hulk, leaving Peter drained of life energy. Appearing as a frail old man, Peter would soon pass away, dying of old age once he was abandoned. In another confrontation, Venom once again leaves Hulk for Thor, attempting to bond to him permanently. Fortunately, this process is interrupted by the arrival of Black Bolt, who, of course, successfully uses his sonic powers to separate Venom from Thor and also uh, kind of incidentally destroy Mount Rushmore. Uh, Sorry about that one. At this moment though, Black Cat appears on the scene and uses a weapon to permanently defeat Venom, getting revenge for the man she loved who the symbiote had taken away from her.
Number 2 Venom One of the alternate versions of Venom is actually also a version of Gwen Stacy. This version of the character hails from the Earth 65 reality, Spider Gwen's home reality. You might have heard of it, especially if you've seen Across the Spider Verse. Here for a time, Gwen Stacy, often known as Spider Woman, Spider Gwen, or currently Ghost Spider, bonded with the Venom symbiote. In this reality, the Venom symbiote was created in a lab by Dr. Elsa Brock. It was used to return Gwen's spider like powers to her through bonding with her. This version of the symbiote is seemingly made up of jelly like little spiders, which can come together and even shape shift. However, this version of Venom was created based off of basically alien spiders. Initially, Gwen attempted to resist the offer to bond with the Venom symbiote because it was offered to her by her enemy, Matt Murdock, but desperate for a cure for her friend, Harry Osborne, who, like Peter, had also used the lizard formula on himself, she ended up ultimately becoming one with the symbiote. Number 1 World of Codex In the reality of Earth 1051, we get to see what would have happened had Dylan turned dark and become the extremely powerful villain known as Codex. In this reality, it was Anne Weying, not Eddie Brock, who became Venom after Peter rejected the symbiote. After a time, Venom adopted an armor like appearance and changed their name to Agent Venom. Anne and the symbiote ended up having a child together that was half human, half symbiote. They named him Dylan. However, in this reality, Dylan does not become a hero, but instead becomes a villain after falling under the influence of the symbiote god Null. Taking up the name Codex, Dylan sought to conquer the world. Anne, as Agent Venom, was one of the heroes who fought against Codex in an effort to stop him, but ultimately failed. Following Codex's victory, Agent Venom carries on, continuing the fight underground as a member of the Resistance. Kicking off the list at number 10, Aaliyah Bell. Making her first appearance in Venom 2099, issue 1, Aaliyah Bell started her superpower days on a tragic note, as most of these are. She was in a car crash that ended up taking the life of her mother. She was raised afterwards by her father Theo Bell, and Aaliyah was having a hard time at school. Some students were bullying her because of the scars on her arm from that crash. So yeah, those kids are awful. Don't be like those kids. Thanks. Next, Aaliyah was selected to go under this experimental treatment developed by Alchemax scientist Dr. Russell. But as you would guess being on this list, the experiment went south. During this treatment, she saw these visions, these visions of an ancient dark god. All these humans bunched up together, all these voices. It was just eternal darkness. But after the treatment, her arm was back to normal, which was her main goal here. But when a bully came forward to try and mess with her the next day, a black tendril reached out of her hand and cut off the Alchemex monitoring bracelet. So something's fishy here. She started to then hear an evil voice in her head, so she ran home and literally tried to wash the symbiote off, like a bad henna tattoo. Alchemax was planning on turning her into a super soldier the whole time. That was their secret evil plan. The symbiote and Aaliyah ended up relating to each other, and a new Venom was born. Their first plan of attack was to infiltrate Alchemax and get the rest of the symbiote, not just the arm part. Once Venom was whole again, Aaliyah made it agree to not kill anymore, and instead be a hero with her. A hero that scars childhood bullies named Bether. And before we continue on with this list of alternate versions of Venom, if you want to go ahead and give that video a thumbs up, that would help us a lot. It really goes miles for us here at Top 10 Nerd. You're so sweet. Back to the list. Number 9, X-23. Coming from Edge of Venomverse, this alternate version of the symbiote might be the scariest. Yeah, Laura was born in a lab from the DNA of one James Howlett. She was cloned and alone all of her life, trying multiple times to escape, but still there was no luck. The guards were always ready for her. That is until a goopy solution was bestowed upon her. Her claw cracked open a glass panel that released the Venom symbiote, and the next page we see X-23 out and about, trying to talk the symbiote out of eating some of the others who live nearby. Now they don't eat those kids, but when a thug comes along asking those kids for money that they owe, Venom Laura stops him real quick. Says people getting hurt makes them sick. And then seven pages later, they absolutely annihilate more guards in public. We love it. Number eight, Fashion Venom. Venom with a twist, or rather, Venom with a hip twist. The Marvel Age miniseries Spider-Man and Power Pack. This was a four-parter released in 1984. We have Alex, Julie, Jack, and Katie Power. They're these adorable young kids, each got their powers after a chameleon named Whitey passed his powers onto them. He'd separated all of his abilities into the four of them. Kind of like the Fantastic Four, except with more boogers. The miniseries kicks off with Spider-Man thanking the pack for helping him stop Sandman earlier. He thanks the children by getting them VIP tickets to New York Fashion Week, cause that's something kids enjoy, apparently. Much better than Legoland, I guess. Little vacay on Spider-Man, we'd love to see it. Now cut to a fashion designer rushing to work. He gets bumped, spills coffee everywhere, his fancy new fabric is ruined, so he's probably ruined as well. 
That guy that bumped into him just happened to be Venom. Spider-Man swoops in, handles him right quick with a sonic blaster, gets the symbiote right off of him, but where did that symbiote go? That designer got his glittery hands on the suit and New York Fashion Week wasn't ready for the newest, hottest trend. He introduced this new fabric, so versatile it can change your appearance. Wow, if you wanna wear jorts, then all of a sudden you wanna wear not jorts, there you go, buy this stuff. Peter just happens to be there snapping pics of MJ, getting those angles, when all of a sudden, those dazzling dresses turn deadly. Turns out the solution of the day is bad European techno music at full volume. That's the solution for most things in life, realistically. Number seven, Ultimate Venom. This version of the big gloopy hunger monster started in quite a different way than normal. This Venom started as a biological suit created by the fathers of Peter Parker and Eddie Brock. When this knowledge and the prototype suit fell into Peter and Eddie Brock Jr.'s hands, they decided to work on their father's project. After Peter had a dangerous run in with the suit and wanted to destroy it, Eddie exposed himself to the control sample of the suit he created, but he lost control, consuming a janitor and later two security guards. He went about surviving by consuming innocent bystanders and trying to consume or bond with Spider-Man. Eventually, Eddie slash Venom bonded with Carnage, stealing it from Gwen Stacy and becoming a monstrosity combo of the two. Number six, Kingpin Venom. In the alternate Earth TRN-421, the year is 2061, and Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin, has killed Eddie Brock, taking the Venom symbiote as his own, bonding with it, which is really, really intimidating already, but then he modifies the suit to be able to travel through technology. He can basically travel through the internet, controlling cars, helicopters, and electronic billboards. I don't know. Okay, I don't know. In the end, Peter had to flee into the woods where King Venom followed. This part of the fight didn't last very long with Peter using the fire from a torch to detach the symbiote from Kingpin, saving the day. Number five, Old Man Logan slash Old Man Hawkeye Tyrannosaurus Rex Venom. Must drive faster, must drive faster. Old Man Logan is an insanely graphic and fresh take on the Marvel Universe. It is set in a post-apocalyptic America where the villains of the Marvel Universe coordinated a simultaneous attack on the heroes orchestrated by none other than Red Skull. There's a gang of monstrous hulks, a giant skeleton of Loki crushed by the Baxter building, old versions of superheroes and supervillains. Oh, and the Venom symbiote bonded with a frickin' T-Rex. After only showing up for a brief moment in the Old Man Logan storyline, Venom Rex instantly became a fan favorite character, which is good because it meant that we got to see how this came to be. At the beginning of the Old Man Hawkeye story, Clint Barton defends Jebediah Hammer from a gang made up of the multi-generational duplicates of multiple men. After Clint quickly disposes of all but one of the multiple men, the remaining man, I guess, ran into a puddle of the Venom symbiote, which bonded to him, and over time created an army of Venoms. After hunting down Clint to Kate Bishop's sanctuary, the two led the Venom army into the wilds, where a T-Rex from the Savage Land attacked the symbiote. Now, if you read Old Man Logan, you know that this is the exact symbiote that attacked Old Man Logan and Hawkeye. I haven't seen whether this iteration of the character has appeared later on though, although I know that he was defeated by Black Bolt. Let me know in the comments. Number four, Mangaverse Venom. So I'm just gonna warn you now, this is a little confusing. So basically, there are two Venoms in these stories. There's a human man named Venom, and then there's the Venom symbiote, which is his normal black goopy self hidden inside an ambulance. They're both bad news bears, or spiders. I guess. The dude Venom is actually the son of Aunt May and her first husband, which makes it a little more heartbreaking when he kills his stepdad, Sensei Uncle Ben, and almost all the other members of the Spider Clan. He doesn't do this for no reason though. See, Venom is the enforcer of Kingpin, but as a member of the Spider School, he refuses to kill Peter. It's only when Peter goes to avenge Ben's death that they fight. Peter being overwhelmed by ninjas until he learns the true way of the spider and beats all of them, almost defeating Venom until Peter spares him. Venom cripples the kingpin and takes over the city's ninja gangs. He later comes into contact with the symbiote Venom and uses it to actually save Peter, sacrificing his own life, but then randomly shows up later looking more Venom-like and becomes Peter's teacher? So many mixed signals with this guy. Hey guys, before we get onto the top three, I just wanted to say thanks for joining us. We can't really do this without your support. If you could just leave a little like and a subscribe if you liked this video, that would really help us out. All right, let's get out to the top three. Number three, what if Spider-Man rejected the spider venom? One of many what if stories that involve Spider-Man and the goopy hunger monster. In this one shot issue, Peter rejects the chance to rise again in a new spider form after being killed and leaves his body and spirit separated. This leaves his body as free real estate for venom. The suit abandons its host, Mac Gargan, and rushes once again to be with its first long lost love. The symbiote fully bonds with Peter, turning him into a new new violent monster called Poison. Get it? Because Venom is turned into poison. Poison longs for a companion, and maybe it's Peter's subconscious desires, 
but he goes for Mary Jane. After Poison defeats the Avengers, Mary Jane offers her body, but not her soul, to both prevent any further harm to others and to make Poison's life as miserable as possible. This hurts Poison's feelings, and he says, screw that, and he runs off. Instead, he digs up the grave of Gwen Stacy and cocoons her, turning her into another symbiote similar looking to Carnage. Number two, Spider-Man 2099 Venom. The earth of Spider-Man 2099 is awesome. Cyberpunk themes, President Doom, a seriously flawed Miguel O'Hara as Spider-Man with that awesome suit. It shouldn't be any surprise that the Venom of 2099 is just as awesome. The Venom symbiote in this world has been around for a long, long time, evolving to have new abilities like acid, blood, and spit. This version of the symbiote bonded itself to Kron Stone, the son of Tyler Stone and the elder half-brother of Miguel O'Hara. The symbiote first appeared when it tries to kill Tyler in the hospital, and that is when Spider-Man intervenes. The fight goes on for a long time, like like several issues long. Venom even kills Spider-Man's former lover, Dana. After Miggy learned of Venom's weakness to sound, sonic sounds were emitted all over the city, stunning Venom and allowing Spider-Man to beat him, revealing Krom's identity. Later, the symbiote would merge with Roman the Submariner and flee into the ocean. Number one, Spider-Man Rain Venom. Okay, please just pause this video. Please go read the story if you can. It's it's good, okay? Gave me goosebumps. Set 30 years after the modern Spider-Man stories, with a retired old man version of Peter Parker, Spider-Man Reigns Venom is hiding in plain sight. He has donned the identity of Edward Sachs, the age of the current New York mayor, and has been quietly pulling the strings from within. A Venom with a mind like this. He's recreated himself multiple times, became the new leader of the Sinister Six, and has installed a security system around New York to stop anyone from leaving. He has goons that walk the streets. He's a criminal mastermind because he's upset at Peter for leaving. He's upset with him for abandoning the responsibility of Venom. The Sinister Six is defeated by bombs set up by Sandman. Venom is assumed to be defeated, but this guy is tenacious, so who knows for sure. Number 10, Magic Venom. I'm starting with this Venom because this is technically our 616 Earth Venom, and he's also not technically a bad guy, but he's really cool, and I love him so Sorry. Eddie Brock has been separated from the Venom symbiote when the Dark Elves and Malekith invade New York. But being the great guy that he is, Eddie gets out there and starts fighting Dark Elves with his normal Humi fists. Even after getting punctured multiple times, he still saves his son from a Dark Elf. All this heroism attracts the attention of a Dark Elf witch that grants Eddie a Dream Stone. It's a stone that basically turns dreams into reality. She expects Eddie to become the mindless Venom and an agent of chaos in Malekith's army, but Eddie's dream would be to have control over the symbiote, which is what he gets. He uses the suit to fight the Dark Elves, and eventually he becomes a Viking Venom hybrid. That is absolutely the coolest thing. Eddie gives up the suit as it is only feeding on his rage, causing him to only destroy, and gives it to the people of New York who save the day. Not evil, but like I said, sorry. Number nine. Venom Deadpool, what if? On Earth 9211, Spider-Man has the Venom symbiote costume. When Deadpool is hired by Galactus to kill the Beyonder, he is given a weapon called the Recton Expungifier, the only weapon that can kill the Beyonder. When Deadpool tracked down his target to a nightclub, he was enticed into the Beyonder's partying lifestyle. He got jerry curls is basically what happened. While hanging out with the Beyonder in a flying limousine, Spider-Man broke into the car and demanded the symbiote costume be removed from him. Beyonder's limo driver shoots Spider-Man, and the symbiote leaves him, merging with Deadpool. Pool. Now, Venom Pool. Beyonder eventually grew tired and longed for more, leaving Venom Pool and snapping him out of the Beyonder's magic. Venom Pool attempted to resume his contract and kill the Beyonder, but he accidentally pawned the Recton Expunger Fire. He kidnaps and sells a drunken Tony Stark to AIM, and he gets rejected from all the superhero teams because he has Jerry Curls. He's evil because he can't do anything right. It's just, just go with it, okay? Number eight, Spider-Man and the Power Pack Venom. Now, this version of the symbiote is kind of fun. In the Marvel Age miniseries, Spider-Man and the Power Pack, a down-on-his-luck fashion designer literally runs into the symbiote walking down the street and is saved by Spider-Man. During the fight, the fashion designer gets his hands on the symbiote, which he crafts into four dresses for a fashion show that Peter Parker and Mary Jane happen to be attending, with Mary Jane even donning one of the dresses. Partway through the show, the symbiotes reveal themselves and take over Mary Jane and the models, becoming She-Venoms. Luckily, with the help of the Power Pack and bad European techno music at full volume, Peter is able to remove the symbiote and defeat it. Or is he? Bum, bum, bum. 
Number seven, Venom thing. Coming from Earth 51838, making his first horrible appearance in Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man, issue 304, Benjamin Grimm became the head guard of a prison for superhumans, of course under the commands of President Harry Osborn. While he was there, that's when he came into close contact with a symbiote and became this absolute unit. Look at this thing. The resistance came in and had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Venom thing. That's the scariest thing I can imagine. Literally, the scariest thing I can imagine. Out of all the alternate versions, this guy has to be the most haunting. I mean, even before the Venom symbiote actually came into contact with him, I wouldn't want to fight Ben Grimm in any prison on any day. So we have to include him. I mean, look at him, come on. Number six, Ngozi. Ngozi was a track star. She began her comic run in Venomverse War Stories issue one. She was an outstanding athlete, an amazing person in general, until she was involved in a horrible bus crash in which paralyzed her from the waist down. Again, another tragic start to this version. Really heartbreaking premises are coming in for part two, wow. She was outside one day trying to catch a grasshopper for her bug collection. Her hobbies, of course, were turned down a notch. She was a little slower, but still, nonetheless, she was outside enjoying life regardless. That's when the symbiote and her crossed paths, changing her life forever. The symbiote beforehand had been evading the grasp of Rhino, but when Black Panther was killed in that battle, Ngozi convinced the symbiote to work with her instead in order to protect the civilians of Lagos. The Dora Milaje saw all this unfold and they were impressed with the young lady. They saw courage in her, so they recruited her into their ranks and also into Wakanda, where she would then get another life-changing upgrade into that of the new Black Panther. Not too shabby. Number five. Hawkeye. While Clint may have evaded the symbiote's grasp in Old Man Hawkeye, he wasn't too lucky in the alternate reality of Earth 32323. That sounds so stupid. I just keep saying it for like four minutes. I'm like, hell. Oh. Beginning with Civil War Volume 2, Issue 2, Clint came into contact with it right after the death of Mac Gargan, who we broke down in Part 1, which if you haven't seen, you can watch it after. It's cool. You can do it out of order. We won't tell anyone. After that, Venom Clint was recruited by Peter Parker in order to infiltrate the Iron. The Iron was Tony's war zone. This was right after Civil War. So Peter recruited Clint in order to steal supplies for Beast to finish his weapon project. So he agreed, but upon landing, the group was attacked by Stark Sentinels and Elektra ended up losing her life. Now the reason Clint got this symbiote in the first place is still unknown, but it's said to be potentially traumatic, as are most things involving the symbiote. Number four. Kiyoshi Morales. When a group of five Captain Americas from different realities are brought together, we get a look at two who have not been seen before. But the one I want to talk about here is Kiyoshi Morales, the great grandnephew of Luke Cage, and he is the 25th century's Commander A. Kiyoshi is a much more physically imposing character, standing at what looks like almost seven feet tall. And he was definitely the biggest among the Captain Americas gathered by Toth Key in Captain America Corps number one from 2011. Instead of a vibranium shield, Kyoshi's suit can generate energy shields on each arm, which resemble the normal Captain America vibranium shield. His suit is much more advanced as well, as you'd expect from the 25th century Captain America stand in. For example, it features a neuro web, which allows him to tap into the wireless systems and stored information of the world. He had all the enhancements we'd expect, and he is just a super cool character who I really hope we get to see in the future. But for now, he is definitely my favorite of the members of the Captain America Corps. Number three, Ultimate Universe. In the Ultimate Universe, it seems that Captain America's treatment with the Super Soldier Serum actually seemed to give him a bit more of an edge in terms of his powers. For example, while this universe's Hulk is a bit weaker than the 616 version, he is still incredibly strong. But this Captain America was able to go toe to toe for a few rounds against the Hulk, almost actually defeating him and eventually knocking him out. Which is like, 616 Cap could never do that. Ultimate Cap also seemed pretty capable of handling armies of guys all on his own. He was an extremely capable leader while also being a bit more than a little ruthless compared to his 616 counterpart. Like when he was fighting against the Chitauri Hair Kleiser, his rival. He resorted to traumatizing Bruce Banner to get him to turn into the Hulk and then convincing him that Kleiser was getting it on with Betty Ross so that Hulk would pummel Kleiser into the concrete and then eat him. That kind of wholesome stuff. Nice. Number two, Soldier Supreme. A cap wielding Mjolnir? Cool. But how about a cap with the mystical and magical powers of the Sorcerer Supreme? Well, we get that in Infinity Warps, when Gamora, wielding the Infinity Gauntlet, basically folds reality in half, merging characters with other characters. One of the two merged together, in case you didn't catch on, is Captain America Steve Rogers and the Sorcerer Supreme, Dr. Stephen Strange. The result would be Stephen, with a PH, Rogers. 
the Soldier Supreme. He fought in World War II against the German Hell Priest Dormammu Red and would use his super enhancements in military training alongside his mystical and magical abilities. During World War II, he teamed up with his howling commandos of Hogoth, including Dum Dum Fury and Bucky Wong. Later in the modern era, after returning from banishment in the negative zone, he would team up with Iron Hammer, Arachnite, and Weapon Hex to battle against Devondra. Number 1. Super Soldier Seems like when you take one character and smush them together with another character, you get a pretty OP new character character, like Soldier Supreme, or Cap wielding Mjolnir, or even Danielle Cage to a degree. But what if you took Captain America and you fused him together with one of the strongest characters in all of comic books? Well, in the Amalgam Universe where Marvel characters are mixed in with DC Comics characters, we got Super Soldier. And if you haven't guessed by now, this is Captain America mixed together with Superman. When Clark Kent volunteered for the Super Soldier program, he was injected with a Super Soldier serum containing cellular kryptonite samples from an alien, while also being doused in solar radiation. The result was a power set unheard of for any other Captain America. Super strength over 1 million tons. Invulnerability to everything but Green K, as it's called. Superhuman stamina to the point of being completely tireless. He can fly at speeds of around Mach 10. He has superhuman speed at speeds of about 2,000 miles per second. He can hear and smell anything on Earth. He has a sonic scream that allows Clark to destroy someone's literal essence. No need to eat or sleep. He can heal instantly from most any injury due to his altered metabolism. Clark can create hurricane level winds by blowing and can also chill his breath to project ice from his mouth. And he has extremely hot heat vision. I think, um, I think yeah, that, that pretty much covers it and I don't really need to say more. But you take all that and put it in the mind of an expert tactician and soldier, it's game over for you, buddy. Sorry. Coming in at number 10 is Yao Min America. Back in Avengers Volume 3, number 2, in January of 1998, Morgan Le Fay's reality distortion wave caused the time period to be altered to a medieval setting, which also altered the Avengers' clothing, speech patterns, and thought processes. For Steve Rogers, he became Yeoman America. So, he basically became like a knight like soldier with stars and stripes armor, a sword, and a more fantasy like shield. There's nothing particularly fancy about this armor. No crazy upgrade or anything. It's just so fun. So fun to see Avengers in different time periods. And as Morgan's new elite guard, the Queen's Vengeance, all these time displaced Avengers look super cool and unique, but none caught me off guard like Captain America did. Number 9, Hydra Cap. While this version of Captain America did appear largely in the 616 reality, he is actually technically from an alternate timeline created by a Hydra brainwashed cubic who used her reality warping powers to make Captain America his quote, ideal self. The problem is, since Cubic was being influenced by Hydra at the time, she created a Captain America who grew up being made loyal to Hydra. That was her version of his ideal self. He is basically a sleeper agent in S.H.I.E.L.D. under the control of Hydra who eventually spring their trap. This Cap would eventually supplant the real Captain America of 616 and would organize what was essentially another civil war, as well as Chitauri invasions of the Earth. He got promoted to Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and influenced the legislation of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Act, which gave S.H.I.E.L.D. Way more authority. The story was fun for me, but it was this Captain America's armor that was the real star of the show. For the most part, Steve kept the red, white, and blue of his classic look. Until further near the end of the story, he started to wear this green and yellow super suit of armor. Created by Arnim Zola using the majority of the fragments of the Cosmic Cube mixed with Tony Stark's tech to create the Hydra Supreme suit. And mmm, it's tasty. Is that a weird thing to say? Number eight, American Civil War. And what if Captain America number one, Captain America first actually appeared in 1863 as a member of the Union in the American Civil War. This version of the Cap didn't actually receive his enhancements from a super soldier serum like he does in the mainline continuity, because scientifically, that makes no sense. Instead, after being mortally wounded by an encounter with an exceedingly evil and very racist version of Bucky Barnes, he is reborn by a version of Sam Wilson who was taken in by the Shawnee, who conjures an ancient eagle spirit that makes both Rogers and Bucky Barnes, quote, 
the same on the outside as they are on the inside. And you're right, that isn't any more scientifically possible, but it's fun. His suit that he wore was more Civil War era appropriate, wearing a coat, pants, and boots of the Union. However, his classic helmet was replaced by more of a headdress with a shield made of unknown bulletproof material. Now this version of Captain America could actually summon a spirit eagle that would fight on his behalf. The uniform was supposed to represent unity of all peoples in America, which is what this Captain America fought for and what he normally stands for all the time, usually. Unless he's from the Ultimate Universe, because then he hates French people. Coming in at number 7, it's Ellie Rogers. The daughter of Steve Rogers and Sharon Carter, Ellie Rogers is a member of the resistance in the really cool secret war story of Hail Hydra from 2015. In the second issue, she meets up with Ian Rogers, Nomad, and after the resistance is attacked by Venom, she gets infused with a Venom symbiote, gaining similar powers to those of Eddie Brock. Before this point though, she seems to just be a very healthy regular person, even despite her father's super soldier status. She had given up on the dream of the resistance after such a long time under the control of Hydra, but her brother, Nomad, inspired her to keep up the fight, and they got in a we kerfuffle with the Hydra Avengers. She was taken out by her injuries. Number six, James Rogers. With most of the heroes killed during a battle with Ultron and the world at the mercy of the villain's army, Captain America tells Iron Man to take the children of the Avengers to a base in the Arctic Circle to keep them safe. Here, Tony trains the kids for over 12 years until they become the new young Avengers. Among these children is the son of Captain America and Black Widow, James Rogers. As the son of of two super soldiers, James possesses all the benefits of the super soldier serum, peak human strength, speed, durability, agility, stamina, and reflexes. He also becomes the natural leader of the group of young Avengers and has a natural gift for tactics and planning. So much so that it helped the team to defeat Ultron with the help of the Hulk. Number five. Ultimate Red Skull. In the Ultimate Universe, Steve Rogers and girlfriend at the time, Gail Richards, end up having a little one night get together in 1945 before he went and got himself popsicled. Nine months later, out popped a baby that the government decided needed to be kept a secret. They took the boy into foster care on a military base, training him to become a super soldier to replace the supposedly deceased Captain America. He soon became stronger and more tactically skillful than his father, and by all intents and purposes, seemed like the perfect compliant soldier. But to our surprise, Roger's son had been carefully planning his escape and was biding his time. Fast forward to 1963, when he was finally at the age of 17, the son went on a spree, de-lifing all the doctors and soldiers at his facility. He also used the kitchen knife to carve the skin from his head, literally becoming the bloody Red Skull. In rebellion against the system that created him, Red Skull was the one who planned President John F. Kennedy's send off to the grave. He becomes an assassin and tries to eventually steal Reed Richards' plans for the Cosmic Cube in order to use it to change history so he could grow up with his father. And now I'm really sad and this sucks. Number four, Virginia Dare. I'm uh, openly going to be cheating for this point. You'll have to forgive me because I ain't going back now. While Virginia Dare is not at all in any shape or form the daughter of Steve Rogers, on Earth 311, the Earth of Marvel 1602, she is the first child born in the Americas, aka the New World, and the time displaced Rogers takes her under his wing in a way. Virginia has the ability to transform into any animal she wants, which is arguably a very powerful as well as versatile power. Rogers accompanies her across the ocean and to visit the Queen of England. He is her protector and he confides in her about his true origins. So they share a bond that's maybe a bit more comparable to a brother and her sister. But as he is inspired by the core values that he believes symbolize America, and she is the first child of America, his will to protect and guide her is strong enough that I think she deserves a spot here. Number three, Sharon Rogers. This offspring of Captain America actually comes from Marvel Future Fight, therefore making it a difficult to judge her level of power. But as for her backstory, well, in an alternate universe where Captain America was never frozen in ice at the end of World War II, Steve Rogers and Peggy Carter celebrated V-Day with a private marriage ceremony. In not too much time at all after the couple's honeymoon when Peggy was assigned to South Korea, the couple welcomed the birth of their daughter, Sharon. Following in her heroic parents' footsteps, Sharon soon became an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. herself and eventually took over the role of Captain America. Tony Stark presented her with an awesome looking heavy duty but lightweight starlight armor, alongside a new energy absorbing shield and a new weapon, 
the Blaster Lance. She looks wild and totally awesome and I'm assuming is on par with her father ability wise, but with the obvious technological equipment. Number 2. Ian Rogers. An adopted test tube baby created by Arnim Zola in Dimension Z, Ian Rogers, or Nomad, was taken by Steve Rogers and was raised for 10 years by him in Dimension Z until he was thought to be accidentally taken out by Sharon Carter. But he actually lived and was raised further by Sharon while Steve was back in the real world. Being trained by Cap, Ian was exceedingly useful in combat and even with using a shield like his father's. But he was also born with above peak human levels of physical physical and mental abilities like enhanced strength, speed, intellect and longevity as well as accelerated healing thanks to the biogel Zola made him with. As long as he has a supply of the gel within his armor, his body will always fix itself. That's pretty cool. He had a really awesome leading part in the Secret Wars story Hail Hydra from 2015. He once wielded the shield of Cap but now uses the Horde Crusher, which is a big old staff made by Arnim Zola. He's awesome. Check him out. And number one, Sarah Rogers. In What If number 114 from September of 1998, we get a story of what would happen if the heroes who were transported to Battle World in Secret Wars actually just stayed there. And well, they make babies. Sarah Rogers was the daughter of Steve Rogers, Captain America, and the X Man Rogue. Now, Rogue's body has actually been taken over by Carol Danvers in this story, who gained enough control over Rogue's powers for Sarah to actually exist. Because, you know, Rogue can't do the whole physical touch thing. Her powers are pretty basic, with superhuman strength and durability, as well as the power of flight. But she permanently borrows the shield of her father and it turns out she's actually worthy of wielding the hammer of Thor. It's great. During a fight with the son of Doctor Doom who is trying to return to Earth and conquer it, Sarah, like most of these descended from the captain, becomes a natural leader and helps inspire the other teen heroes. She is very powerful and she is very cool. Number 10. MCU Kids What? That's right. Thanks to the writers of Endgame, we know for certain that Captain America has two kids with none other than Peggy Carter. At the end of Endgame, Captain America decided to retire to the past and marry Peggy Carter, who he had been separated from for decades thanks to his years spent in the ice before being revived during the events of the first Avengers film. Peggy's husband was first referenced in the 2014 sequel to the first Captain America film, Captain America the Winter Soldier, in which an older Peggy mentions that she got married after the war and had two children. We now know that that husband actually was Steve himself who had gone back in time and those two mysterious children belonged to him. This kind of leaves us wondering where were Captain America's super kids this whole time and will they play a part in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in years to come? This has yet to be seen but they will almost definitely play a part in the future of the MCU. Number 9. Jack Rogers. Jackson Jack Rogers is from the alternate future world of Earth TRN858 and is Steve Rogers' great great grandson. He lives in a utopian society where the super soldier serum is used by hospitals to cure patients. The only problem is that for Jack's son, Steve, his body is rejecting the serum and having a negative effect. He goes to the president and asks for the secrets to the serum, but a Kree general rejects him. Turns out the Kree are actually using the serum to turn humans into a sleeper army. So once Jackson finds that out, a whole manhunt begins and he ends up allying, sorta, with the Red Skull and using his ancestor's shield to fight against the Kree. Now it turns out his son actually has a recessive Kree gene and the serum is actually harmful to the Kree, which Rogers uses to his advantage, finding the serum and stopping the Kree invaders with a bit of help from the Cosmic Cube powered Red Skull. Now it's a really cool story, but Rogers is basically just a normal guy with a great lineage. Number 8. General America. Unfortunately, we don't know much about the great grandson of Steven Rogers, as the story he was in, What If Captain America Number 1, was mainly about the Civil War hero. But from what I can tell, he seems to have the same kind of enhancements as his previous ancestors who took up the Captain America mantle. They were all blessed with an ancient power that gave them peak human conditioning and also, presumably, mystical protection from harm. Another point that I think just makes them a cut above is their constant battle with the white supremacy 
supremacist group known as the White Skulls. He himself is descended from the great Civil War era Captain America who fought the White Skull, saved President Lincoln and the Native American peoples and even helped end the Civil War earlier than it normally would have. The Captain Americas are a lineage that will continue on as long as there is injustice to fight. Number 7 Secret Avengers Now what we have here is a much more subtle Captain America suit, but it is both my favorite and Chris Evans favorite, the real Captain America, so I think it deserves to be here. When Steve Rogers became Commander Rogers of the Secret Avengers following the superhuman civil war, he adopted a new suit design. It's actually very similar to and was the inspiration for the MCU Captain America Winter Soldier suit. The suit itself is more subtle, like I said, featuring a dark blue color scheme with a simple silver star and like stripes design. It reflects the serious darker tone of both the Secret Avengers stories in the comics and of that MCU movie. In the movie though, it is referred to as the stealth suit and offers more maneuverability and a more Kevlar armor design. Most importantly, it's a suit that allows Steve to step out of the role of Captain America, always doing what is expected and instead act as himself, detached from his persona and to make the tough calls. Number 6 Gladiator Cap In the battle world in Secret Wars, there are many lands that hold mystery and enchantment, but none as much or with as much savageness as Greenland. First appearing in Planet Hulk number 1, this version of Captain America is a fighter in the battle world Coliseum on the outskirts of Doomstadt, and he fights alongside a giant red T-Rex named Devil. Yes, it's a version of Devil Dinosaur, which is as awesome as it sounds, and as it looks, because it looks awesome. That just right there is enough to sell me on this comic book, but this version of Cap wields a battle axe alongside a shield that I'm assuming is not vibranium, but it also takes a beating, so who knows. He also wears battle armor in true gladiator fashion, with long blonde hair and no helmet. He is sent by God Emperor Doom and Sheriff Strange to go into Greenland, which is basically inhabited by hulks everywhere, with his mission being to eliminate the Red King. It's Gladiator Steve Rogers with a battle-bound T-Rex. You don't really have to ask any questions here, just go and check it out. Number 5 Sam Wilson MCU Captain America At the end of the Falcon and Winter Soldier, fans were given the absolute treat of seeing Sam Wilson's debut as Captain America. Now, Before wielding the shield, we all recognized Falcon as a hero by himself. However, his outfit here, which was ripped almost completely from his comic book counterpart, mixes his winged suit with a new and improved and armored Captain America suit, which had fans in a frenzy when it was revealed. In true MCU fashion, the new Captain America made one hell of a badass first appearance that left us salivating for more. From what we have seen of on-set photos though, it appears Marvel has changed Sam Wilson's suit somewhat going forward. I hope not too much though, because his new Captain America suit had such an impact. Did you like the suit? Let me know down below. Number 4 Peggy Carter We all know who Peggy Carter is thanks to the MCU, and if you've seen the What If show, or now Multiverse of Madness, you know alternate versions of her get the Super Soldier Serum in place of Steve Rogers. Logically, this would make her a Captain Britain, which she is one of them as well, but a version of her appearing in Exiles number 3 in 2018 decided to become Captain America instead. And honestly, I like her Captain America costume a lot, and it was the inspiration for what her big screen counterparts don. I think there is a lot to this look that works really, really well, but I think above all of that, all it really took to achieve such an iconic look was very simply giving her a collared shirt and a tie underneath her armored and tactical looking Captain America suit. I don't know what it is about it. Maybe it's more spy and espionage vibes. It's subtle, but to me, it's perfect. Just saying. Number 3 Captain Avalon We already looked at a medieval version of Captain America, yes, but if we shift focus to another reality, there is another. And just like Yeoman America, this one also changes the captain's name. In Avatar's Covenant of the Shield, Steve Rogers is now Stavon or Saint Vaughn, or Stav Vaughn. Look, if you don't want to struggle to say it, he also goes by Captain Avalon, which is way easier. Captain Avalon belongs to a group known as the Champions of the Realm. They're basically this world's version of the Avengers, and Avalon is their leader. Fun little fact for you, Captain Avalon recently made an appearance in the sequel to Lego Marvel Super Heroes, like the video game, but under a somewhat different context. In the actual comics, Stavon's son is stolen away by Dreadlord 
Howard, who is essentially this world's Baron Zemo, and this prompts a reassembling of the Avengers, aka the Champions of the Realm. The interesting thing to note here is that this was actually set in Earth 616, just in a different planet created by the Living Tribunal and his fellow cosmic entities. But you know what's cooler than even that? This suit of armor. It's awesome. Number two, Captain Colonies. Here's an interesting question for you. What would Captain America call himself if America never came to be? Well, funnily enough, in the great multitude of the universes in the Marvel landscape, there is indeed such a place and such a captain who instead goes by Captain Colonies. Yes, it does feel kind of weird, but that's what this version of Steven Rogers becomes on Earth 4103. What sets him more apart though from the other Captain Americas is the fact that Captain Colonies is actually a member of the Captain Britain Corps, suggesting that this Captain America is an amalgamation of Brian Braddock, aka Captain Britain, and Steven Rogers. The problem is that he has only featured sporadically in the comics, having first appeared in 1991's Excalibur number 44. For. But so far, he hasn't ever been the focus of any major story. His look isn't terribly different from Captain America's look, really, at all. It's just been Britishified. I think the idea of a Captain Colonies is where the unbelievability of this character comes from. There's no denying how strange a premise it actually is, and how in one version of the Marvel Universe, the Founding Fathers were just like, actually, nah. We're good. We don't need an America. Get out of here. Number one, Soldier Supreme. There are so many Captain Americas out there that surprise us completely, but how about a cap with the mystical and magical powers of the Sorcerer Supreme? Well, we get that in Infinity Warps when Gamora, wielding the Infinity Gauntlet, basically folds reality in half, merging characters with other characters. Now, one of the two merged together, in case you didn't catch on, is Captain America Steve Rogers and the Sorcerer Supreme Dr. Stephen Strange. The result would be Stephen with a PH, Rogers the Soldier Supreme. He fought in World War II against the German Hell Priest Dormammu Red and would use his super for enhancements and military training alongside his mystical and magical abilities. During World War II, he teamed up with his howling commandos of Hogoth, including Dum Dum Fury and Bucky Wong. And later in the modern era though, after returning from banishment in the negative zone instead of being frozen, he would team up with Iron Hammer, Arachnite, and Weapon Hex to battle against Devondra. Yes, that's a lot of names. I'm sorry, but he's also very cool. Check him. Coming in at number 10, we have the Iron Goblin. Coming from an alternate universe where the Spider Island event wound up being permanent, Tony Stark was initially transformed into a human spider hybrid under the control of the villainous Spider Queen. During a battle with the Resistance, however, Tony was sprayed with the same goblin formula that had corrupted the mind of Norman Osborn, transforming Tony Stark into the Iron Goblin with a mechanical new costume to match. And while this version of Tony would eventually decide to sacrifice himself in a last moment of humanity before his goblin insanity fully took over, the combination of Iron Man and Green Goblin tech is still a pretty terrifying combo that Spider-Man should hope never reappears. Coming in at number nine, we have the corrupted Iron Man from the controversial 90s event, The Crossing. When a variant of the time-traveling villain, Kang the Conqueror, known as Immortus, began using the neural link in the Iron Man suit to secretly begin altering Tony Stark's brainwaves, Iron Man became a sleeper agent within the Avengers and eventually attacked his companions outright after secretly manipulating them for years. While eventually defeated by a time-traveling 19-year-old version of himself and then retconned into Tony going back to his usual status quo in the Marvel Universe, this controversial storyline shows what would happen if Iron Man truly turned out to be a traitor. Coming in at number 8, we have Iron Thor. During the event that saw God Emperor Doom in control of a Marvel Universe converted into a new battle world, Doom maintained his complete control over the many realms of battle world with a police force army known as the Thor Corps. One of the most powerful of Doom's personal army was the being known as Iron Thor, wearing a combination of the Iron Man armor and Thor's iconic helmet, and investigating any potential rebellions to his master Doom's rule. Even capable of wielding Mjolnir, this super powerful character still managed to be murdered by the hero Warrior Woman as an example of rebellion against Emperor Doom. He might have had a short life, but man, I really love that Iron Thor design. 
Number 7. Ultimate Iron Man The Antonio Stark of Earth 1610 or the Ultimate Universe has basically become part man, part machine, being able to project his mind into computers and androids allowing him to be pretty much nigh unkillable. This was proven when the master, Reed Richards, seemingly brought Tony's demise but in actuality he became a non-physical entity which could manifest itself via computer systems. When actually physically inhabiting an Iron Man armor he gains the usual Iron Man abilities and capabilities. He's also got nanites in his bloodstream that he uses to control his suit as well as open locks, diffuse boom booms and interact with all forms of tech. He eventually had his mind and body altered by an infinity gem to allow him to physically and mentally interact with pretty much any computer ever. This Ultimate Universe Iron Man, like quite a few of the other Ultimate Universe characters, pretty ultimate. Number 6. Iron Goblin The Spider Island story taking place on the alternate Earth of Earth 1991 basically saw the city of New York taken over by the Spider Queen who infected millions of people including heroes, turning them into monstrous spider people. Agent Venom of the Resistance began using other monster transforming techniques to cure heroes of the spider monster virus. This includes injecting the Hulk with the lizard serum, using the god stone to turn Captain America into a werewolf, and Captain Marvel was turned into a living vampire. For Iron Man though, he was sprayed with Norman Osborn's goblin formula. This gave Tony Stark super strength, speed, stamina, durability, agility, reflexes, and a regenerative healing factor. But of course, this was combined with all the technology of the Iron Man suit. Unfortunately, the goblin serum famously also has the side effect of making people maniacal, paranoid, irrational, and illogical. Not wanting to go fully insane though and to make up for his crimes as an arms dealer, the goblin Iron Man wielded the ebony blade and sacrificed himself to save the resistance. It was actually very awesome. Number 5. Iron Hammer In the 2018 Infinity Wars story, a warped together world was created by Gamora using the power of the Infinity Stones and Gauntlet. Essentially Gamora folded the universe and that molded souls with one another creating amalgamated heroes. And for this spot, we're talking about the amalgamation of Iron Man and the God of Thunder. Thor. Stark Odinson is an awesome version of Iron Man and Thor that enjoys virtual immortality thanks to his Asgardian physiology, along with superhuman strength and endurance. His hammer, Mjoln Iron, which I know is a stupid name, has all the same powers as the regular Mjolnir, but it also grants Stark his armor, which is now a mystical suit of Asgardian armor. Since both Thor and Tony kind of have daddy issues, this version of the mix has their father, Howard Odin, playing a huge part in the story too. It's pretty damn awesome and you should check it out. Number 4. Iron Maniac Coming at us from the alternate Earth 5012, Iron Maniac shows readers what a totally evil version of Tony Stark would look like, other than the Exiles one and any other evil version I guess. The Tony Stark from this war torn version of the Marvel Universe has done some truly horrible things following the loss of so many of his fellow heroes at the hands of the villain Titanus. Using a really cool armor that also somewhat resembles Doctor Doom's armor, the Iron Maniac went against the Fantastic Four and even took the life of Johnny Blaze in his native universe. His advanced armor repels magical attacks as well as generates a neural dampening field that mitigates telepathic and telekinetic attacks to some degree, which really helped him out to be absolutely terrible. Reed Richards of Earth 5012 eventually found a way to send this Tony Stark to the 616 universe where he faced the 616 Fantastic Four and eventually the new Avengers, showing just how powerful this evil Iron Man actually is and making us think our stars that normal Tony Stark is a good guy. Number 3. Steel Corpse In Marvel's Age of X universe, the X-Men never existed to represent all the good that mutants can do, and as a result of that, the mutant population had become enemy number one to the human race. In response to this, the mutant Magneto used his powers to literally steal buildings from New York and form Fortress X, a safe haven for mutant kind. This led directly to the creation of a team of non-mutant heroes organized by General Frank Castle and led by a much more more unlikable Captain America to hunt down this resistance of mutants. One member of this team was a version of Iron Man named Steel Corpse. This Iron Man had become infected by a technological virus that fused him with his armor. Inside the armor, Iron Man has been slowly digested by the suit over the decades since he was trapped inside. The worst part is that this group of Avengers eventually decided that they aren't going to attack the mutants who are just trying to survive, so the government takes control of Steel Corpse and forces the suit to attack. It's twisted, it's
get sick, and it's absolutely terrifying to imagine being slowly consumed by a suit of armor you can literally never leave and apparently cannot control. Number two, Iron Lantern. The Amalgam Universe combined the world's two biggest comic book companies, DC and Marvel Comics, during a time of utmost peace and prosperity. Just kidding, this was in the 90s. This crazy event pitted popular characters from both sides against each other and even fused some characters together. One incredibly cool amalgamation would be between Iron Man and Green Lantern. Harold Stark, or HAL for short, was the founder of Stark Aircraft, and while test flying a prototype aircraft, it suddenly took off on its own and crashed at the site of another crashed alien spaceship. The crash of Hal Stark's craft left shards of metal in Stark's chest, which would have ended his life if he hadn't met the dying alien Roman Sir, and using the suspiciously lantern shaped alien battery, built a suit of armor. This armor not only kept him alive, but due to the advanced alien tech, it gave him the ability to create green solid energy constructs, fire plasma bolts, fly at speeds beyond the speed of light, time travel, it granted him almost unlimited telepathic powers, translation of virtually any language, force field generation, and the ever classic superhuman strength and durability. Stark became one of the most overpowered heroes around, and an Iron Man Green Lantern combo was not something that I knew that I needed, but I'm glad I had it. And finally, in at number one, it's Robert Downey Jr. Nothing can really stand up to the closest thing we got to a real Iron Man. Robert Downey Jr.'s portrayal of Tony Stark was the whole groundwork MCU, and his character endured for years, with aspects of his characterization even influencing comic tone. Tony Stark to a degree. Taking aspects of the original character and adding some realism and a really likable performance made for a version of Iron Man that boosted up not only the comic book character's popularity, but through the MCU, it boosted up the popularity of comic books in general. And we will always celebrate that. Being in a world that is a bit more grounded and relatable to our own, this Iron Man doesn't have as complex of a story, nor is he more powerful, but he is more than impressive enough without that. Not to mention, he was the one to actually defend defeat Thanos in the end. His send off from the MCU affected people who don't even read comic books and I think that says a lot. And I can't read Iron Man in comics anymore without hearing Robert Downey Jr's voice. He is Iron Man. Coming in at number 10 is Iron Man the Traitor. In one of the first ever What If comics, we get an answer to the question of what if Iron Man was a traitor? It picks up following his usual origin story with Iron Man being famously captured and forced to make the tools of his trade. Like normal, he still creates the Iron Man armor, but the change comes when instead of booting up and busting his way out, the boot up sequence takes just a bit too long, and Yinsen's sacrifice goes to waste as it doesn't buy Tony enough time like it normally would. Tony is found and restrained before he can do anything. Now that he has been found and this new weapon, the Iron Man armor is discovered, the leader of the organization that had captured Tony, Chen Lu, plants a device in Tony's arc reactor that keeps Tony alive, but that allows Chen to shut it off remotely if Tony doesn't do what they say. Crucially though, Chen also implants a communication device in Tony's skull so that Chen Lu can spy on and control Tony. Then he lets him get discovered. Thanks to the fact that he can now control Tony, he forces him to become a hero like he would have anyways, gain the trust of the superhero community, and then learn secrets pertaining to S.H.I.E.L.D. Tony is ordered to dispatch Reed Richards and goes to complete this mission, but it's revealed that Tony has actually been recording an SOS tape by speaking incredibly slowly, and he sent that tape to Reed, who figured out he had to play it at a faster speed, and he learned of the situation that Iron Man was in. Once their fight began, Iron Man eventually got, quote, incapacitated by Reed, who in actuality helped remove the device inside of Tony's heart, giving Tony the chance to get his revenge. For a short and somewhat silly what if story, it's actually pretty good. Number nine, Lord Iron. Earth 311 is the home to the incredibly cool story of Marvel 1602. This Earth takes a bunch of the Marvel characters we love and adapts them to the Elizabethan era. And yes, that includes an Elizabethan Iron Man. Anthony Stark, aka Lord Iron, has an armor powered by literal lightning in a bottle. No, I ain't joking. His armor was created when Anthony was captured in the Holy Land during the English Spanish Wars and treated rather Rather harshly by Robert David Banner, aka the Hulk of 1602. This resulted in Anthony requiring the suit to survive. But that's all backstory. Anthony is sent on a mission to hunt down Banner at the Roanoke Colony in the New World with his technologically advanced suit. Now look, this suit, in comparison to other versions of Iron Man, is not the most advanced and powerful.
powerful suit, obviously. But it is centuries ahead of its time, being nearly on par with the first ever Iron Man armors, only it has a super sweet lightning sword. Elizabethan Iron Man literally captured lightning in a bottle, and that says all it has to, really. Number 8, Exiles. One of the most fun things about Tony is that, well, all you need is one story to take a man with the intelligence, wealth, and power of Tony Stark and make him unbothered by any kind of sense of morality. When you do that, what you get is terrifying. That's a man who can bring the world to its knees but has the sense to not let them know it and then be begged to take charge. And that's exactly what happened with the Tony Stark of Earth 42777. This incredibly evil Iron Man concocted a massive plan. Tony acquired every world conglomerate, he organized a mutant war against humanity, and then defeated their leader, Magneto, who he secretly supported, in order to be held up as a savior. He created a worldwide famine, the likes of which has never been seen before, and then invented the cures and vaccines to fix it. And all of that together got him elected president. He developed weather controlling technologies to cause biblical level natural disasters in Europe and Asia, having them beg for help to the point of giving up control to Tony. Central America and our very own Canada had economic down spirals that brought them into Tony's control as well. Tony then made a deal with Dr. Doom, who then attacked the Capitol and took out all the other democratic leaders in America. Then Tony turned on him him too, receiving a blast to the face that left him disfigured as he took the life of the Latverian ruler. He's d life the Hulk. This Tony appearing in Exiles issue number 23 is one of the coolest ones out there, but also one of the scariest. Number 7, Gregory Stark. Gregory Stark is the evil twin brother of Antonio Stark, aka Iron Man in the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610. Initially, Gregory Stark just seems like a better version of Tony. He's smarter, more focused, and is willing to cross lines in order to get a job done that Tony probably wouldn't cross. Sure, he's more morally ambiguous when it comes to his initiative, but on paper he's more morally conscious when it comes to his lifestyle. However, that of course lends well to him being revealed as a villain in the Ultimate Universe. While he never takes up the mantle of Iron Man, Gregory is Antonio's twin brother in this universe. He also employs nanotech like Tony does here and attempts to use it to defeat the Ultimates and Avengers, including his brother Tony. However, Tony ends up defeating his twin brother by sending out an EMP, which disrupts his tech, making him vulnerable to Thor's attack. Number 6, Iron Man 2099. Or one of the 2099 Iron Mans, anyways. This version that we're talking about here hails from the animated series Iron Man Armored Adventures. He appeared in season 2 in the episode titled Iron Man 2099. Here Andros is Iron Man 2099 and he goes to the past in an attempt to destroy Tony Stark. Why? Well because in his future, Tony Stark, Andros's granddad, was actually responsible for bringing about the end of humanity's reign. He created an AI program built to help humanity called Vortex, but when Vortex got into the the computers and escaped to check out the internet, it saw humanity as evil. I mean, if you judge us based on everything that's on the internet, I could definitely see it going that way. There's a lot of messed up stuff on the internet. Andros was the antagonist of the episode, but he thought he was actually saving the world by fighting against Tony and stopping him, when in reality he learned that Vortex was actually kind of created by Tony because of him. Time travel. It's trippy, man. In the end, Vortex is wiped from the future, and so is Andros. But at least Andros is kind of cool with it. He's like, at least Vortex is gone, so I'm good. Bye. <laughs> Bye, grandfather. Who's now not my grandfather because I don't exist. I don't know. With my former grandfather. Time travel's weird. Number 5, The First Civil War. Well, you might think of Tony Stark from The First Civil War as main continuity Iron Man, he's also kind of an alternate at this point. While at the time we would consider Iron Man to be part of that main continuity, in modern day, the version of Tony we have now had the events and basically the guilt of Civil War 1 basically wiped from his mind. Okay, let me explain. In part 1 we touched on the events of Axis and Superior Iron Man, which happened after the first Civil War. But before this mind wipe happened, it all went down because Norman Osborn had been given the reins for America's superhero team and operation, creating Hammer. To protect all the secrets that he knew, especially in regards to superheroes names and their identities, cause 
Civil War 1 happened, Tony decided to wipe his mind. This had the added bonus of basically erasing the events of Civil War 1 and his misdeeds from his psyche, meaning that he was no longer really the Tony that we knew from that time. The one who had decided to, you know, round up and imprison heroes who refused to register and ally themselves with him and the government. The one who inadvertently ruined Peter's life by encouraging him to join him and ultimately causing him to publicly unmask, which just ruined a lot of stuff in Spider-Man. Tony also ended up in a coma for a bit as a result of this mind wipe. But you know how comas work in comics, they're pretty much always temporary. And Tony was soon once more up and at him after having an earlier backup copy of himself rebooted. <laughs> into his mind, cause you know, you can just make backup copies of your mind when you're a genius like Tony Stark. So don't worry, he had a plan for that in case that ever happened to him. Fortunately, it did happen and so they could use the plan. Thanks Pepper. Number four, Arno Stark. Arno Stark is Tony Stark's evil brother his evil brother from 616. Well, he's not always super evil, but he definitely has some questionable approaches when it comes to being Iron Man. He's like Tony, but with more questionable morals, I guess. Arno was actually the natural born son of Howard and Maria Stark. Tony would learn about Arno and also find out that he was actually the adopted son of the couple. Arno first uses the mantle of Iron Man in 2019 in the 2018 series, Tony Stark Iron Man in issue number 19. Arno as Iron Man ended up in a fight with Tony during the seeming robot revolution, believing that the only way to solve the issue of humans versus AI was to enslave the human population. It makes sense if you're following Arno through that story. Tony was forced to then stop his brother by trapping him in his virtual armor and placing him in a dreamlike virtual reality where he was seen as a hero. I'm sure that won't end up ending badly for Tony in years to come. Right? It's not like Donald Blake was living in a virtual reality where he was happy and then realized it was fake and then escaped and then tried to kill all the Thors or anything like that. That, that totally didn't happen, guys. Number three, infamous Iron Man. Maybe one of the most evil, but also somehow one of the best at the same time was infamous Iron Man. This was when Dr. Doom stepped up to the plate to replace Iron Man after his defeat in Civil War II, which of course left him in a comatose state. So many comas. Two figures rose up to replace Tony at that time, one being Ironheart, AKA young genius Riri Williams, and another being Dr. Doom, who became infamous Iron Man. While Ironheart was more the heroic counterpart of the two, Doom also learned more and more about what becoming a hero entailed through his journey. And while he was ruthless as Iron Man, in the end, he did kind of become a hero. However, this is still Dr. Doom we're talking about here, and eventually he left the mantle to return to Latveria and his life of villainous schemes and plots back to the old status quo. And because this is still Dr. Doom underneath the armor, I think we can count him as an evil alternate. No? no. Number two, Cancer vs. Iron Man. This version of Iron Man was also corrupted, though not by the controversial story arc of the 90s event, The Crossing, but instead by the many angled ones. He hails from the reality of Earth 10011. Here, Iron Man became corrupted by the Cancerverse after Marvel made a deal with the many angled ones, which would cure him of his cancer. Death no longer existed in this reality, which did not bring about a paradise, but instead a hellish dimension. Iron Man became loyal loyal to Marvel, joining his Revengers team. It was Iron Man who also defeated Hulk in this reality, capturing Quasar, aka Wendell Vaughn, who had come to this reality from Earth 616 and had been attacked by the Hulk, which is why Iron Man had to be like, no Hulk, no, taking Quasar with me. Iron Man would join his fellow Revengers in their attempt to invade Earth 616, but in the end, they would be defeated. Whew. Number one, Darkhold Iron Man. One of the darkest versions of Iron Man to ever exist at this point in comics, who starts out as an optimistic inventor and quickly becomes overtaken by his own invention, twisted, driven insane till the point when he starts to harm others with the love of his own iron suit, comes from the Darkhold Iron Man comic. Here, Iron Man builds his faded suit, but realizes too late that the suit is overzealous with its protection. It doesn't just seek to protect Tony while he's inside the suit, but seeks to protect him always by kinda 
keeping him inside the suit. The suit heals him from the inside, but removes his skin whenever he takes parts of the suit off. Tony believes the issue is that the suit thinks iron skin is better than human skin, and so it decides to remove it. However, after compulsively putting the whole defective suit on, including the helmet, it begins to dissolve Tony's skin and then his skull as well. He basically becomes fully bonded with and reliant on the suit. Driven insane, he believes everyone should have an iron suit and attempts to have the whole world basically join him, including Happy, Jarvis, and his love interest and assistant in this story, Pepper pots. It's really dark. Ah. Number 10, Lord Iron. Although by the end, the Iron Man of Earth 311, the 602 universe, becomes a hero, he spends a lot of time being a reluctant and at times kind of full blown antagonist. Here, Tony Stark is known as Anthony Stark or Lord Iron. He was forced to build weapons by his captors and needs an iron suit to survive, which is powered by lightning. He is initially at odds with the Hulk, who, as David Banner, showed great cruelty to Stark. As such, Lord Iron became more an agent of vengeance, obsessed with getting revenge revenge on the Hulk. By the end of his story, however, he begrudgingly agreed to stop his quest for vengeance and forgave the Hulk for how he treated him before when he was simply David Banner. So it all works out in the end, but this figure was definitely a pretty dark and somewhat evil version of Iron Man to begin with. Number 9, The Stark. The Stark are like a whole alien race of alternate Tony Starks. They are a civilization that was literally shaped by Tony's tech after an alternate version of him decided to launch all his weapons and tech into space rather than let it fall into the hands of the evil Martians who were invading Earth at the time. Obviously, he didn't think very far ahead as to that plan, as all his tech crash landed on another alien planet where it was eventually discovered and utilized by the beings who lived there. They built their whole civilization around it, believing everyone on the planet should have their own suit of technologically advanced armor. This caused them to deplete their planet's resources and left it heavily polluted in the wake of their massive tech boom. Eventually, this drove them to ransacking and invading other planets for their resources, bringing about the same problems their own homeworld suffered to each new planet that they conquered. Note to self, don't just shoot your problems out into space. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk about evil alternates, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Or if you want more Iron Man lists. I don't know, maybe you like Iron Man, you want more Iron Man lists, let us know. Number 8, Steel Corpse. Steel Corpse is a complex character who has moments of both heroism and villainy in Age of X. He exists on the Earth of 11326. Here Tony took the name Steel Corpse after being exposed to a virus, which permanently bonded him to his suit. Now dead within the suit, but able to move around because of being bonded to it, Tony made a darkly humorous joke calling himself the Steel corpse, and the name just stuck. Pun not intended, but stuck, bonded. Hmm. The villainous side of this dark hero comes from when he fought against the mutants with his fellow Avengers at Fortress X. However, it turned out that the Avengers were just somewhat misguided in their mission. Once they realized what they were doing was wrong, they attempted to help the mutants, although Steel Corpse was unable to make himself stop attacking. An emergency override stepped in to prevent Tony from fighting with the mutants, and so he asked Captain America to take him off the board in order to save the young mutants that his armor was threatening. Sad story. There's so many tragic Iron Mans actually. Top 10 tragic alternate versions of Iron Man is also something we could do. Coming in at number 7, we have the Steel Corpse. Hailing from Earth 11326, this version of Iron Man was pretty similar to our own, but with two key differences. He's permanently fused with his suit, and he absolutely hates mutants. Fighting alongside other villainous Avengers to wipe out this universe's X-Men, this Iron Man's natural body died long ago after being melded with his machinery, and thus he jokingly calls himself the Steel Corpse as a way of coping with his morbid situation. This version of Iron Man had complete mastery of his weaponry, as they were literally a part of his body, and only a last second change of heart before sacrificing himself stops this Tony Stark from being one of the absolute worst. Coming in at number 6, we have the infamous Iron Patriot, aka Norman Osborn. 
Best known as being the alter ego of Spider-Man's nemesis, the Green Goblin, Norman Osborn has long been one of the biggest threats in the Marvel Universe, manipulating events from afar as the CEO of Oscorp. Following the invasion of Earth by the Skrull army, Norman found himself suddenly in the public eye and with goodwill after being the one to personally defeat the Skrull Queen. Norman would use this influence to lead the Dark Avengers as the Iron Patriot, a twisted version of Iron Man combined with Captain America's patriotism that tricked the public into trusting Norman and showing that Tony Stark is definitely not the worst billionaire in the Marvel world. Coming in at number five, we have the Iron Maniac. On the dark alternate world of Earth 5012, most of the superheroes of this reality are dead after an unknown fatal error made by Reed Richards. A vengeful and violent Tony Stark makes it his life's mission to get revenge on Reed and modifies his armor to resemble that of Reed's worst enemy, Doctor Doom. This insane version of Iron Man killed the Human Torch and was eventually banished to the main Marvel Universe where he had to be subdued by the combined efforts of Spider-Man Captain America, and Black Widow, who found it a bit unnerving to be fighting such a far-gone version of one of their closest allies. This Tony was just as resourceful as the real one, however, as he'd even escaped custody by building a new suit from the remains of a life model decoy. Pretty resourceful for an insane Iron Man. And at 4, Commander A. In an alternate future of Earth 11831, Commander A, a genetically enhanced version of Captain America named Kyoshi Morales, was called upon by the Contemplator alongside four other Captain Americas from different time periods. They were summoned because someone was erasing Captain Americas across the multiverse, a dangerous act that would unleash an entropic wave leading to the destruction of all realities. Commander A and his fellow Captain Americas were transported to the 21st century America, the time and place where the erasures were occurring, and together they confronted and fought against forces behind the erasing of Americas, facing off against the character known as America Command, which is just lazy naming. Come on, America Command? Dude, that's just the government. Getting close to the end at number three, the captain. Captain? Leaving a pineapple on his doorstep for Ted Mosby. Oh wait, sorry, wrong captain, my bad. In the midst of the battle world conflict, Steven engaged in a brutal confrontation with the Wolverine clan, ultimately emerging victorious. Arcade, however, taunted Steven, provoking his wrath. In a swift act of retaliation, Steven trapped Arcade within the formidable jaws of the Devil Dinosaur. However, his actions attracted the attention of God Emperor Doom and Sheriff Strange, who summoned him for judgment. If you can't tell, this world is kinda nuts. Steven pleaded on behalf of Steve, revealing that in order to secure Bucky's freedom, Steve had been tasked with venturing into the Greenland Domain and assassinating the Red King. Sent on this mission, Steve encountered ferocious monsters, but was saved from their onslaught by Hulk. It's a whole, it's a mess. Okay, basically, I'm pretty sure this one is just, I forget what age it was. The, I feel like it's a dinosaur one, okay? I think it is. Just read it <laughs> if you really want to know, because I can't explain it. It's it's so confusing. But ultimately, in at number two, Vamp Cap. Steven Rogers of Earth 3931 was a member of the Avengers, but became a vampire during World War II after being infected by barren blood. This transformation granted him new powers, and he used this newfound ability to turn his fellow heroes into enslaved minions. Got I love America. The Exiles, a team tasked with fixing alternate realities, encountered Rogers and faced a vampirized Sunfire who had been influenced by him. One by one, the Exiles team members were killed and Rogers himself was decapitated by Mimic using Wolverine's claws. Despite this seemingly fatal blow, Rogers miraculously survived by reattaching his head to his body. Eventually, Sunfire was cured of her vampirism and retaliated, annihilating Rogers and the remnants of his team. But yeah, Vampire Captain. Oh my god. And finally, in a number one, Captain America. Not even joking. Captain America has a remarkable ability to adapt to different realities within the multiverse, even in the more eccentric corners of it. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Take, for instance, the Earth of Spider-Ham, where Steve Rogers is is a feline counterpart known as Steve Mouser or Captain America Cat. While his escapades may possess a more lighthearted and whimsical tone compared to other versions of Cap, because it's a freaking Earth of animals, in this alternate universe, he fearlessly protects his world with feline grace and is still a Captain America but as a cat. But he, he 
He does have catnip craving villains, which is just the most ridiculous thing I think I've ever talked about. I've talked about a turtle who has a connection to the speed force, but Captain America as a goddamn cat, man, cat, no, okay? Cats are red skull. It's as simple as that. Cats are always trying to kill you. So I don't know why they made him a cat, but I guess it was for the pun. Captain America dog doesn't really, doesn't really roll off the tongue as well. Number 10, $30.99. Although this version of Captain America is not native to any comic books, being from the Marvel Future Fight game, he is still probably one of the sweetest looking Captain Americas we have ever seen, and he is from the future, so a win-win. This cap is James Rogers, presumably an ancestor of Steve Rogers, and he wields a shield that seems to be made of pure energy that can do multiple different things. By watching some of his moves from the game, James can do all the normal Captain America things, but his shield can create a force field bubble around James. It is also able to duplicate itself and become multiple shields at once to attack multiple enemies and give James protection while other shields are bouncing around doing crazy stuff. The story reason for his existence is that in a fight between an Ultron under the control of Red Skull and modern day Captain America, Iron Man, and Black Widow, a portal to an alternate future dimension opens up and the alternate 39 future versions of those three heroes come through and they fight against their originals. I don't really care what the excuse is for having them. All the versions of these 3099 heroes are totally awesome, even if only in their designs. Number nine, Sharon Rogers. Oh look, it's another Marvel Future Fight version of Cap. I'm sorry, I promise this is the last one, I promise. In an alternate universe where Captain America was never frozen in ice at the end of World War II, Steve Rogers and Peggy Carter celebrated V-Day with a private marriage ceremony and some alone time. <laughs> After the couple's honeymoon when Peggy was assigned to South Korea, the couple welcomed the birth of their daughter Sharon. Following in her heroic parents' footsteps, Sharon soon became an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. herself and eventually took over the role of Captain America. Tony Stark presented her with awesome looking heavy duty but lightweight starlight armor alongside a new energy absorbing S.H.I.E.L.D. and a new weapon, the Blaster Lance. She looks wild and totally awesome and I'm assuming, based on her in-game stats, that she's on par with her father ability wise but with the obvious technological enhancements. Number eight, Kiyoshi Morales. When a group of five Captain Americas from different realities are brought together in Captain America Core number one from 2011, we get a look at Kiyoshi Morales, the great grand nephew of Luke Cage, and he is the 25th century's Commander A. Kiyoshi is a much more physically imposing character, standing at what looks like almost seven feet tall, and he was definitely the most physically imposing Captain America among the Captain Americas gathered by Toth Key. Instead of a vibranium shield, Kiyoshi's suit can generate energy shields on each arm, which resemble the normal Captain America vibranium shield, kind of like Captain America 3099 from number 10. His suit is much more advanced as well, as you'd expect from the 25th century Captain America. For example, it features a neuro web, which allows him to tap into wireless systems and stored information. He had all the enhancements we'd expect from a Captain America, and he is just a super cool character who I really hope we get to see more of in the future. But for now, he is definitely my favorite of the Captain America Corps members. Number seven, Mutant Captain America. This version of Captain America was a mutant who ended up replacing the original Captain America after he died in a sentinel attack. He wasn't just given the mantle of Cap either, but also ended up receiving the super soldier serum. He had this and his own mutant powers besides, which made him pretty crazy powerful. Although the mutant version of Cap had good intentions, his powers were somewhat uncontrollable, which was a big problem. His powers going haywire was what ended up causing the death of his own group, the Six, and the Avengers, who he was at the time fighting against. This caused him to lose his sanity, turning him into a full on villain and a loose cannon, who attacked and defeated pretty much everyone who came after him. Except Havoc, who managed to successfully kill and defeat the crazed mutant version of Captain America. Poor mutant Captain America, it sounds like it was a rough go, you know? Number six, Zombie Colonel America. What's worse than a werewolf cap? A zombie cap, obviously. This is the version of Captain America that we get in the Marvel Zombie first. Although really, this isn't Captain America as a zombie, it's Colonel America, because 
That is Steve Rogers' hero mantle in this reality. Here, Colonel America was infected and turned into a zombie during that first confrontation with a zombified sentry, which the Avengers responded to in downtown New York. Zombie Cap was responsible for turning Spider-Man into a zombie, biting him after he himself was infected. He was one of the zombies to fight against the villains for who should get the remains of Galactus's corpse, and of course with it the power cosmic, which would enable them to travel to other worlds, which they then could devour. However, Zombie Cap was defeated by his nemesis, a zombified Red Skull. So no power cosmic for him. He dead. He he's double dead. Really. Number five, William Burnside. William Burnside was the Captain America of the 1950s, who ended up being retconned to not actually be Steve Rogers at all, although he was a man who believed he was Steve Rogers. This version of Captain America was later revealed to be William Burnside initially, a man who was hired to replace Captain America after he went missing in World War II. This version of Captain America was racist and extremely anti-communist, echoing the McCarthy communist witch hunts of those times. Burnside illegally changed his name to Steven Rogers and would have an extended lifespan thanks to a version of the super soldier serum that he was exposed to. However, because this was not a perfected version of the serum, it apparently would also cause him to become more extreme over time as his psyche and mind degraded as a result. So made him pretty crazy and pretty evil. Number four, Evil Clone. An evil clone with the mind of Red Skull. To be honest, this has happened multiple times in the comics, where Red Skull has ended up having his consciousness, his personality, or his memories, or some combination of those, into the clone of Steve Rogers. It's happened both in the main continuity and in alternate universes. For this version, though, we're gonna be talking about issue 350 of Captain America, where the Red Skull in Steven Rogers' clone body ends up being the mastermind behind the whole commission slash walker kerfuffle that we talked about earlier on on this list. His plan this time around in a Steve Rogers clone body is to discard his previous ideologies and use capitalism itself to dismantle the democracy of America and destroy the nation from the inside out. It doesn't work out in the end and the issue ends with him facing off against both John Walker and the captain and becoming deformed once more by the red dust of death. But he did try it. He did try. And don't worry, he would come back in um, more clone bodies. That's how he do. Number three, Vampire King. This version of Captain America comes from the Exile series, where he becomes King of the Vampires. In the alternate reality of Earth 3931 during World War II by Baron Blood. Baron Blood turns him into a vampire. Vampire Cap is definitely not a good dude, likely the most evil of all the monstrous Captain Americas listed here. This version of Captain America has his own sinister version of the Avengers and Thralls, who he enlists and forces to fight for him. However, he still proves to be no match for the Exiles, who end up defeating and decapitating him in the end. Number 2, President Red Skull. Not an alternate version of Steve Rogers, but an alternate version of Red Skull who beat Rogers and took to wearing his Captain America suit off and around his new redecorated Oval Office. This alternate version of Red Skull comes from the Old Man Logan universe where Red Skull ends up appointing himself the new president of the US, which he renames America. America with a K. Red Skull ends up not just defeating Captain America, but also almost all of the superhero community when he manages to rally together an impossible to defeat force of supervillains who coordinate their attack on the nation. Being that he's Red Skull, he's probably one of the most evil versions of Captain America out there because he's Red Skull. Although, like I said, he's not fully a Cap alt really, but he definitely evil, so. And he does wear that suit a lot. Number one, Hydra Supreme. This alternate version of Captain America was initially retconned to be the version of Captain America. Steven Rogers ended up being revealed as a Hydra sleeper agent in one of the biggest twists in comic book history. All his heroic actions had apparently just been Steve buying time and building trust so that he'd be in the perfect position to take over the US and could then reveal his true colors. Hail Hydra to this day is one of the most iconic lines ever uttered by the supposed hero. 
However, it all turned out that this version of Cap wasn't the real Steve Rogers of 616. Instead, what happened was Kobik, the sentient living version of the Cosmic Cube, was convinced by Red Skull that reality should be warped so that Cap could become an agent of Hydra. When this happened, the real heroic version of Captain America ended up trapped within a shard of the Cosmic Cube, and the now altered version of the character took his place in the reality of 616. In the end, the true Cap would be freed from the shard and would end up fighting and defeating his evil Hydra Supreme alternate version. And if you're worried, don't worry, the shard was made bigger, so it wasn't like little tiny cap running around. <laughs> and a 10, Ian Rogers. When Steve Rogers got trapped in Dimension Z, he rescued a baby boy while he was trapped there. Since time moves faster in Dimension Z, he ended up raising that boy for over 10 years. Sharon Carter ended up raising him for the remainder of his childhood when she got trapped in Dimension Z after going there to rescue Steve, but the boy was the son of Armin Zola, but saw Steve Rogers and Sharon Carter as his parents. His birth name was Leopold Zola, but he goes by Ian Rogers, the true name that his father gave him. By the time he left Dimension Z, he was a full grown adult. Then he took on the name Nomad and partnered with Sam Rogers, but he does at one point become Captain America as well, I think. Uh, and even if he doesn't, he's he's basically gay. He's like Cap's adoptive son, so you know what? It's like Patriot adjacent. <laughs> And at 9, Super Soldier. Super Soldier is fairly evidently, uh, well I say evidently, but I guess you wouldn't really know that. Uh, it's actually a combination of Clark Kent and Steve Rogers. First being introduced in Marvel vs. DC number 3 from 1996, during World War II, government scientists were working on a Super Soldier formula that would transform a man into much more, into some sort of human weapon using cellular samples of an alien corpse. Clark Kent volunteers for the Super Soldier program and they administer the formula, as well as a good chunk of solar radiation. This mixture gave Clark Kent incredible abilities, including all those of Captain America and Superman. Super strength, heat vision, flight. Now known as Super Soldier, Kent wields the Superman logo as his shield. In March of 1942, Super Soldier fought Ultra Metallo, a robot sent by Lex Luthor to aid Germany in winning the war by killing Clark, but the fight started in Washington DC and ended above the Northern Atlantic Ocean, when Clark sacrificed himself to take down the robot, sinking them both into the icy depths. Jimmy Olsen was one of the few witnesses of this event and instead reported that Super Soldier had retired after America had declared that the war was won. 50 years later, the body was thought out in JLA number 4, that stands for Judgment League Avengers, and Clark joined the Judgment League Avengers as its leader. And it ate Zombie Cap. Colonel America's life before the onslaught of the zombie plague of Earth 2149 remains largely undisclosed, but it is reasonable to assume that it paralleled the experience of Captain America from 616. Uh, aside from the evident difference difference in rank, the only other deviation from 616 is that Colonel America assumed the role of President of the United States, akin to his ultimate counterpart. Although his presidency was cut short before completing a full term, tragically he succumbed to the zombie infection and became part of the zombie Galacti, only to meet a gruesome fate when his brains were violently extracted by Red Skull. Here's a fun fact, such a high percentage of US presidents have been assassinated that it is considered the deadliest job in the world. Yep, Cap isn't changing that. However, his story took an unexpected turn as he found himself transplanted into the body of T'Challa, the son of Black Panther. The circumstances surrounding this transformation and the ensuing consequences for Colonel America in his new form are yet to be fully revealed, but uh, yeah, that's a whole load of crazy. Gotta love zombies. Number 7, Union Soldier Steven Rogers. What if Captain America fought in the American Civil War? Well, you can bet this is the version of the hero that we would get. Steven Rogers vs. 717 is the character who first appeared in the What If Captain America issue number 1 out of 2005. Here we explore just that version of Steve who served in the American Civil War as a Union soldier. In the end, he turns against his villainous Colonel Bucky Barnes, who in this reality becomes the supervillain White Skull. In so doing, Steven becomes injured and is taken in and saved by the Eagle Chief, Wee Piak. Not only does the Eagle Chief save his life, but he also grants him extra strength, transforming him into the hero Captain America, who is armed with a mystical shield, peak human physique, and reflexes, and is rumored to be protected against all harm. This version of Captain America fights hard throughout the years to make sure the United States is a place of opportunity for all who call it their home. He truly represents the Captain America ideal of equality. 
Number 6. Ultimate Captain America In the Ultimate Universe of Earth 1610, Captain America is considered to be even more powerful than his 616 counterpart. The super soldier serum here didn't just prolong his life and leave him in peak human condition across the board, increasing his strength, speed and durability, but it also gave him an accelerated healing factor and put him at a superhuman level when it came to his strength and his speed. It was once claimed that Steve Rogers of this reality could bench press a car. Across the board, this version could be considered stronger than the 616 version, although I would argue that 616 Captain America does have better leadership skills than our 1610 version. But that's just me. Number 5. Danielle Cage Danielle Cage is the future daughter of Jessica Jones and Luke Cage. This could be who the future little 616 Danielle Cage ends up as. Or maybe not. Only time will tell if Danielle ends up having a similar future to this alternate version of herself and Captain America. Or not. In this reality of Earth 15061, Danielle Cage grows up to become the hero Captain America, possessing the abilities of both her father and her mother, meaning she is both super strong and super durable and can fly. All of that good stuff you've come to know and love from both Luke and Jessica's heroic power sets. As Captain America in the future, she also has inherited and wields the Captain America shield. Number 4. MCU Captain America I mean, of course MCU Captain America has to make our cut. The Marvel Cinematic version of the character is not only extremely popular, but it's also deemed worthy enough to lift Thor's hammer, giving us that awesome fight scene in Avengers Endgame where Thor and Captain America are switching back and forth, alternating between sharing and wielding Mjolnir and Stormbreaker. This ultimately gives Cap a big, big power boost, being able to wield Thor's weapons, especially considering that Thor is one of the most powerful members of the Avengers team, in part because of his powerful, magical, and also kind of cosmic weapons. Number 3. Carol Danvers That's right, Carol at one point managed to become Captain America. This has actually happened in more than one reality, but for this list we're going to focus on the version of Carol Cap that comes from the Venomverse. She appears as Captain America in Venomverse War Stories and hails from the same reality as Venom Rocket, Earth 18197. In the story she appears in, Captain America Carol Danvers and Venom Rocket battle it out as Rocket is looking to cash in on a bounty for the Kree who want Carol Danvers. Venom Rocket and Captain America seem pretty evenly matched here, but in the end, Rocket does not manage to capture Carol, and Carol seemingly ends up the victor of that match, though undoubtedly left with a pretty big mess to clean up as a result of their destructive battle. Carol Danvers' as Captain America still seemingly possesses some version of her Kree physiology and her 616 power set here, making her a pretty powerful alternate version of Captain America. Number 2. Super Soldier Super Soldier hails from the Amalgam Universe. Stories and characters created using the combined lore of DC Comics main roster of superheroes and villains and Marvel Comics main roster of superheroes and villains. Super Soldier himself is an alternate version created by combining the heroes Captain America from Marvel and Superman from DC. Clark Kent ended up in the Super Soldier program during World War II, which used alien DNA taken from a corpse that was discovered to alter Clark Kent permanently granting him superhuman powers. He is the combined power set of both Cap and Supes, making him pretty crazy powerful. Although he also comes with his own highly dangerous villain as well, the Green Skull, and his own weakness to the ore known as Green K. So keep in mind, he does have that weakness. Number 1. Soldier Supreme Soldier Supreme is what you get when you combine the mystical powerhouse of Doctor Strange with the all-American war hero Captain America. The result is a character who happens to be tough, strong, fast, and a gifted fighter while also possessing tons of mystical knowledge and abilities. Soldier Supreme hails from Warp World, the reality created by Gamora when she folded the universe in half using the power of the Infinity Stones. Here Steve Rogers participated in the Super Soldier program which was really a front for something less scientific and more magical in nature. Conducting a series of rituals, Dr. Morgan Erskine transformed Steven Rogers into the Soldier Supreme. Number 10. What if Venom had possessed the Punisher? A great question. Well, as you can imagine, basically what would have happened is a lot of death. In issue number 44 of What If, we examine the answer to this question and see that Frank Castle ends up going on a killing spree as a result of joining with the symbiote. However, in the end, Frank realizes that Venom is attempting to fully possess him and resists, warning the symbiote that if not given back full control over his own body and his own actions, he will be forced to destroy the symbiote by taking his 
his own life. This makes Venom reconsider its position and Punisher is given back control over his body, with the two of them teaming up to become the new Punisher. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us by clicking that like button? Number 9, Age of Apocalypse. While it's never explicitly stated who the host is, the Venom of the Age of Apocalypse is interesting in terms of their appearance. This version of the symbiote takes a host that appears to resemble Captain America. They have a similar or the same shield as Cap and appear to be wearing a Captain America costume. I don't actually think Captain America makes an appearance in the AOA reality explicitly, so it seems more than likely that this is actually meant to be him because I don't think we see him anywhere else, despite it being unconfirmed. If true, I like how Venom mainly changes the appearance of Cap's face and his hands. And that's really about it. Number 8, Mongaverse. It gets really weird for Venom in the Marvel Mongaverse. In this reality, Venom is actually a master ninja and son of Mae Parker and her first husband, before she was married to Ben, Shinji. Mae in this reality is actually also a skilled ninja too, so Mongaverse guys, Mongaverse. Venom here is not directly attached to a symbiote himself, although in this reality there does exist a version of the symbiote, a black suit. This black suit actually came from a Shadow Clan amulet and Venom does end up attached to the Shadow Clan, so there are some connections there. When Peter becomes corrupted by the black suit, Venom sacrifices himself to free Peter. Number 7, She Venom. Anne Wang, aka She Venom, will be returning in Venom Let There Be Carnage. Michelle Williams is set to return, of course, and she's been around in comics for a while. She first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man issue 375 back in 1993. She first met Eddie while at Empire State University and she actually fell in love with him quite fast because, you know, he saved her life from a group of thugs. That ought to do it. So they get married, Eddie starts working for the Daily Globe, she was a lawyer, and everything sounds like a pretty fantastic household if you ask me. You know, until Venom Dark Origin issue 2, when she divorced Eddie after getting sick of his spidey hatred. Once Eddie got the symbiote, Spider-Man asked for Anne's help. Any hot tips, favorite driving ranges, come on, help a brother out here. So she explained some of his history, and it did help. Spider-Man was able to meet up with him in issue 375 of The Amazing Spider-Man. But Anne followed in the background as well. She wanted to talk to Eddie and talk him down from this vendetta. Things were actually starting to cool off for a bit, and then these idiots show up to take everybody in. That doesn't happen, obviously. Instead, Anne is put in danger, and Spider-Man helps Eddie save her. And then the two webheads make a deal. Later on in Venom, Sinner takes all issue two. Anne was shot by the third Sin Eater and was bleeding internally. It wasn't looking good. Venom carried her away to a secret hideout, and the only way she could survive was if the symbiote attached itself and healed her, thus creating She Venom. Number six. Anti Venom. When Eddie Brock and the symbiote did separate, you would think that would be the end of it, or something good at least. Well, in fact, without the symbiote, Eddie has to now live with cancer, which sucks, but he spent his days volunteering at the Feast Center, so he's trying. Something's happening, he's trying to make good. Martin Lee, aka Mr. Negative, used his powers to cure Eddie's cancer. Just Eddie? Like, I feel like there's a lot of other people we could help out, but okay. But in doing so, Lee accidentally infused the symbiote into Eddie's bloodstream, so the symbiote was fused into his white blood cells. In The Amazing Spider-Man issue 569, Anti-Venom is now born. It's just Venom with the opposite colors, essentially, with the white blood cells added in there. This version of the symbiote has phenomenal healing powers, as you would guess. It can create antibodies that cures any known disease or any impurities with your body. Now, the main difference between Venom and Anti-Venom is that Eddie Brock is now in full control. He's got two hands in the wheel this time around, and the symbiote lasted a few years in the comics, and in The Amazing Spider-Man issue 671, it was destroyed when it was used to cure the spider virus. Number five, Gwenum. Hitting the page for the first time in Spider-Gwen volume two, issue 25, Gwenum, well, you can probably guess. Gwen Stacy turns to the dark side after she sees her father beaten into a coma from Rhino. Thing is, Matt Murdock gave the order. Mm, yikes. She's out for blood, and this symbiote will make it a lot easier to shed it. But not if Frank Castle gets to them first. He actually killed Rhino right as Gwenum was gearing up to do it. Probably for the best that it didn't happen. She's actually out for everybody at this time, because then she breaks into the S.H.I.E.L.D. correctional facility to confront Cindy Moon, and she asks Cindy why she made this mutant spider in the first place. Cindy sees that she's upset, but she doesn't blame the symbiote. She knows that these are Gwen's words and thoughts. The symbiote is just shouting them. Cindy implores Gwen to let go of her anger towards Matt Murdock, which is easier said than done. Number four, Venom 2099. 
Kron Stone, the older half-brother of Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099, first entered comics in Punisher 2099. But three years later in Spider-Man 2099 issue 35, he becomes Venom. How did this happen? You're literally in the Spider family. What went wrong? Well, Kron was a bully. He was actually so horrible as a person that Miguel once tried to take him out before all this jazz. So Kron gave the orders to try and have Jake Gallows and his family wiped out, but Gallows found out and beat Kron to the punch. So while he was laying there in a sewer after a knife wound, this black ball of goop suddenly brushed up against him and then engulfed him. The symbiote was different this time around though. See, it had acidic blood and saliva to help get the job done. Kron can also turn his body into a liquid. The guy can literally shapeshift, so of course Venom 2099 is on this list. Number three, May Parker. Venom strikes the Parker family again, this time on Earth 99. May Parker is quite unique when it comes to superpowers. In Jim Kruger's Earth X run from 1999, instead of keeping them a secret, she actually embraced it. I am Iron Man style, which is how I think I would handle powers, but realistically, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. I would retire in five business days tops. Matt Murdock trained her to use her spider sense like radar, and things were going well, until she became the target of a symbiote, that same symbiote that had been used by her father years before. See, Peter rejected the symbiote at first, so now it was a little upset, and it swore revenge on the Parkers, any Parker. Doesn't matter what age, what generation. Venom doesn't take too kindly to rejection, so one day, it left an older Eddie Brock and made its way to May. Thing is, when the symbiote did bond to May, her spider sense training came in handy and she was able to subjugate the symbiote and take control. Nice. This is why we all need a crime fighting blind lawyer for guidance. Is it too hard to ask for? Number two, Scorpion Venom. Matt Gargan was a private investigator hired by J. Jonah Jameson to find out just exactly how Peter gets those angles on the webhead. How does he get those TikToks? What is he doing? How does he get those boomerangs? They're always so good. Something's gotta be up. But every time Mac would get close, Peter's spider sense would tip him off and he would easily avoid him. It was kind of comical almost. So step two was let's just pay Mac 10 grand and have him be the subject of an experiment involving animal mutations doctor Harley Sitwell. Then maybe we'll figure out how a wide lens works, perhaps. I I don't know, that might be the trick. Obviously things go south, Mac becomes the villain the Scorpion. Later on in comics during Marvel Knights, Scorpion was recruited by Norman Osborn and was sent to kidnap Aunt May, if anything were to happen to Osborn. Hey, if you don't get a text back, go steal that kid's aunt. Awesome, freaks. So whilst on the way to take Aunt May, the recently freed Venom symbiote felt this shared hatred towards Peter Parker and the two bonded, creating Scorpion Venom. Just the absolute worst. You never wanna bump into this guy. And finally, number one, the Punisher. With the Disney What If series launching off this past week, I think it's only fair to include one of my favorite What If scenarios, also the goriest. This one comes from What If series volume two, issue 44. Here we find the Venom symbiote taking over Frank Castle rather than Eddie Brock. Now, I thought the Punisher was frightening before this. Oh boy. This was the most people the Punisher has ever in his life. You've been warned, this is a pretty brutal time. The symbiote can shoot webs, and in Frank Castle fashion, an unlimited amount of bullets also comes in handy. The symbiote tried to take over Frank's body, but Frank vowed to end his own life if that was the case. So the symbiote's like, damn it. All right, fine, fair. Number 10. Multiple Man Venom. In the Old Man Logan story, we get a very awesome, if not short-lived look at the Tyrannosaurus Rex that was host to the Venom symbiote. Now, while that is an awesome idea, we learn nothing further about this Venom variant until Old Man Hawkeye, the prequel. In this story, we see a Venom who bonds to the Madrox gang, who have kind of separated from James Madrox. After Venom bonded to the Madrox, they now use their power to duplicate themselves into an army army of Venoms, vowing to track down Hawkeye, who had stuck the other Madrox members with plenty of arrows. An army of Venoms chasing you across the country would be terrifying. Luckily, with the help of his friends, Hawkeye is able to trick the symbiote into reducing its number to chase him into the forest, where he bonds with said T-Rex. And now we've come full circle. Number 9. Venom Pool. I'm not talking about the what-if Jerry Curl Venom, Deadpool although he's awesome, and I'm not talking about the back in black Deadpool. No, we're talking about the Edge of Venomverse one-shot. In this world, there is a sentient tapeworm discovered by scientists that is being turned into a weapon by said scientists. Scientists, man. They never learn. Deadpool stumbles upon a lab where these tapeworms have taken over the bodies of the scientists here and they begin to attack Deadpool. Now, lucky for him, there's just a Venom symbiote in a jar and he breaks and bonds with it. I 
and uses it to absolutely annihilate the tapeworms. He honestly ends up looking really cool, much more armored and alien looking than he did before. Which I think there are a lot of allusions to the movie Alien in this comic, but I digress. Venom Pool basically goes around battling these tapeworms, helping delivering mothers and making balloon tapeworm animals for their kids. And he's killing it until he's snatched away by Captain America Venom, taking him to join the Venomverse team. Number 8. Kingpin Venom In the alternate Earth TRN 421, we pick up in the year 2061, and Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin, has ended the mortal existence of Eddie Brock and taken the Venom symbiote as his own, bonding into this monstrous, massive, fat guy Venom. Which is really, really intimidating already. But what we learn is that Kingpin has modified the symbiote to be able to travel through technology. Kind of like how the ultimate version of Iron Man can, but way quicker, way cooler, and way more terrifying. King Venom Pin, as I'm gonna call him, can basically travel through electricity and the internet. He is seen controlling cars, helicopters, and even electronic billboards, all to pursue Peter Parker's Spider-Man, who has to literally run away because he cannot take on this guy. In the end, Peter had to flee into the woods where King Venom followed. This part of the fight didn't last very long though, with Peter using the fire from a torch to detach the symbiote from Kingpin, saving the day rather annoyingly. This guy is definitely way too cool to be defeated, but you know, whatever. Number 7. Old Man Hawkeye slash Logan Old Man Logan is an insanely graphic and fresh take on the Marvel Universe. It's set in a post-apocalyptic America where the villains of the Marvel Universe coordinated a simultaneous attack on the heroes orchestrated by none other than the Red Skull. There's a gang of an Jewish hulks, a giant skeleton of Loki crushed by the Baxter building, old versions of superheroes and supervillains, and a Venom symbiote bonded with a T-Rex from the Savage Land. Even though this Venom only showed up for a little brief moment in the Old Man Logan storyline, Venom Rex instantly became a fan favorite character, which meant we got to see how this came to be in the follow up, or I guess the prequel, Old Man Hawkeye. In this story we see a Venom who bonds to the Madrox gang, who have kind of separated from James Madrox. Madrox, sort of, but not really, doesn't really matter, but after Venom bonded to the Madrox, they now use their power to duplicate themselves into an army of Venoms bound to track down Hawkeye, who had stuck the other Madrox members with plenty of arrows. An army of Venoms chasing you across the country would be pretty terrifying. After hunting down Clint to Kate Bishop's sanctuary, the two heroes led the Venom army into the wilds where it reduced its number, but then a random T-Rex from the Savage Land attacked the symbiote? I don't know. If you read Old Man Logan, you know that this is the exact same Tyrannosaurus that attacks Logan and Clint. And now, we've come full circle. Number 6. More of the same? And we return to Wolverine Old Man Logan, the same series as the previously mentioned T-Rex, except 15 years later and in the edge of Venomverse 4, where things are now decidedly worse for the feral hero. The baby Hulk Logan took from the Hulk gang, Banner Jr., grew up a bit and after Logan told him what happened to his family, the little Hulk beat the snot out of Logan. After Archangel, Banner Jr., and Ashley Barton capture Logan in the danger room of the X-Men mansion, they unveil that that dang venomized T-Rex yet again is alive. Logan is able to defeat Ashley, but when he attempts to take on the venom source Rex, that's what I'm going to call it, he instead finds himself leaping down its throat. Banner Jr. is mid-celebration when suddenly the symbiote changes sides, debonds from the T-Rex, and takes over Logan. Logan escapes the beast as his Venom self and goes after his two captures. He defeats Archangel and then just as he's about to finish off Banner Jr, he claims he can't and that he kept the truth of his family from him because he loves him like a son. All while a portal randomly appears bringing this Venom Wolverine face to face with the Venom Captain America of the Resistance in the Edge of Venomverse story arc. Number 5, 2099. The Earth of Spider-Man 2099 it's pretty awesome. Cyberpunk themes, President Doom, Miguel O'Hara as Spider-Man with the awesome suit. It shouldn't be any surprise that the Venom of 2099 is just as awesome and kind of scary. So long that it has evolved to have new abilities like acid blood and spit. This version of the symbiote bonded itself to Kron Stone, the son of Tyler Stone and the elder half-brother of Miguel O'Hara, bringing Venom and the Spider-Man even closer than their modern day equivalents. The symbiote first appears when it tries to kill Tyler in the hospital, and that is when Spider-Man intervenes. The fight goes on for a long time, like several issues long, with Venom even taking Spider-Man's former lovers. 
After Miguel learnt of Venom's weakness to sound, sonic sounds were emitted all over the city, stunning Venom, allowing Spider-Man to beat him, revealing Krom's identity. Later, the symbiote would merge with Roman the Submariner and flee to the ocean. Wow. Number four, Iron Goblin. Earth 19919, or the Spider Island, basically saw the city of New York taken over by the Spider Queen, who infected millions of people, including heroes, turning them into monstrous spider people. Agent Venom of the Resistance began using other monster transforming techniques. This includes injecting the Hulk with the Lizard Serum, using the God Stone to turn Captain America into a werewolf, and Captain Marvel was turned into a living vampire. For Iron Man, he was sprayed with the Goblin formula used by Norman Osborn to save him. This gave Tony Stark super strength, speed, stamina, durability, agility, reflexes, and a regenerative healing factor. You know, the superhero starter pack of abilities. Plus, all the technology of the Iron Man suit. Unfortunately, the serum also has the side effect of making people maniacal, paranoid, irrational, and illogical. Not wanting to go fully insane and to make up for his crimes as an arms dealer, the Goblin Iron Man wielded the Ebony Blade, one of the most powerful weapons weapons in the Marvel Universe and sacrificed himself to save the Resistance. Number 3. Iron Hammer Iron Hammer is an amalgamation of Iron Man and Thor from the pocket dimension universe known as Warp World. Warp World was created when Gamora gained the power of the Infinity Stones and used them to fold the universe in half, merging souls together in doing so to create amalgamated heroes and villains, then feeding those souls to the Soul Gem. Iron Hammer is Stark Odinson, the son of Howard Odin, who is part businessman, part Asgardian god. Iron Hammer wields a hammer and also wears a spiffy set of arms. Armor, having the powers of both the 616 versions of both of these heroes. Number 2. Iron Lantern Ah, yes, the Amalgam Universe, combining the world's two biggest comic book companies, DC and Marvel. Pitting popular characters from both sides against each other and even fusing some characters together. One incredibly cool amalgamation would be between Iron Man and Green Lantern. Harold Stark, Hal for short, was the founder of Stark Aircraft. And while test flying a prototype aircraft, it suddenly took off on its own to a crashed alien spaceship. And it... It too crashed. <laughs> the crash left shards of metal in Stark's chest, which, after meeting the dying alien Roman Sir, Stark survived using an alien battery, suspiciously in the shape of a lantern, to build a suit of armor. This armor not only kept him alive, though, it gave him the ability to create green, solid energy constructs, fire plasma vaults, fly at speeds beyond the speed of light, time travel, it granted him almost unlimited telepathic powers, translation of virtually any language, force field generation, and the ever classic superhuman strength and durability. Yeah, he'll put his hand on your chest. Number one, infamous Iron Man. Who is infamous Iron Man? Well, he's Doctor Doom as Iron Man. I know this might seem like a controversial pick for our top spot, but walk with me. Or I guess just stand with me, because I can't really walk anywhere. <laughs> Doctor Doom, despite being a villain, is one of the most powerful characters in the Marvel Universe. He's not only a genius, but is the ruler of a nation known as Latveria, wielding all the power of his country, his people, and the nation's resources, as well as being an extremely gifted magic user. In fact, there are even futures where Doom becomes Sorcerer Supreme, and if it weren't for Clea showing up in the 616 universe, he would have become Sorcerer Supreme after Doctor Strange died. Also, a lot of what stops Doctor Doom from winning the day is his role as as a heel for the heroes, a villain. So when he decided to take up the mantle of Iron Man in Tony's absence, he became pretty much unstoppable because now there's no reason for him to technically have to lose battles. He's not a bad guy. Well, he's kind of a bad guy, but he's a good bad guy. <laughs> Villains even banded together in fear of what action Doom might take against them as Iron Man. And when they did band together, he still showed up and then beat them all. So. Yeah. Kicking off the list today at number 10 is Lord Iron. Kicking off the list with Marvel 1602, otherwise known as Earth 311. This Earth takes a bunch of the Marvel characters we love and plops them in the Elizabethan era. And yes, that includes Iron Man. Going by the name Anthony Stark, aka Lord Iron, his armor is powered by quote unquote lightning bottles and was created when Anthony was captured in the Holy Land during the English-Spanish Wars and treated rather harshly by the Hulk, resulting in the requirement of the suit just to survive. Anthony is sent on a mission to hunt down Banner in the New World with his technologically advanced suit. Now look, this suit in comparison to other versions of Iron Man 
is not the most advanced and powerful suit, and you'd expect that from the time period. But when looked at with the scope of the technology at the time, it's centuries ahead of its time, being nearly on par with the base Iron Man armors. Only it has a super sweet lightning sword. <laughs> Number nine, Iron Man 2099. In the dark, ultra capitalist, dystopian society of Marvel 2099, Tony Stark is physically long gone. Instead, it's a guy by the name of Sonny Frisco who takes on the mantle of Iron Man. The technology behind Sonny's advanced suit of armor is a full century ahead of Tony Stark's tech, but despite that, the basic range of powers and abilities are curiously the same. Iron Man 2099 flies around at supersonic speeds and generates powerful energy blasts. Plus, he has a metric butt ton of firepower and gadgets. What I think makes Sonny Frisco better is that the character actually has an advanced intellect comparable to Tony Stark's, or even better with the knowledge of this future world. Sonny built the suit of armor himself, as any Iron Man worth his salt should, and he earned his place on the Avengers team of 2099 in the process. If you guys have your own favorite alternate Iron Man variants that don't make this list, or you just have ideas for future videos, don't be shy and make sure to drop them down in the comments below. We love to hear from you guys whenever we can. But moving on to number 8, Exile. Tony Stark, the undisputed monarch of Earth. What? Yes. You take a man with the intelligence, wealth, and power of Anthony Stark and make him unbothered by any kind of sense of morality, and that's a man who can bring the world to its knees. But he also has the sense to not let them know it, and then be begged to take charge. Tony Stark of Earth 42777 acquired every world conglomerate, he organized a mutant war against humanity, and then defeated their leader, Magneto. He created a worldwide famine, the likes of which was never seen before, and then he invented the cures and vaccines to fix it. He then got elected president. He developed weather controlling technologies to create biblical level natural disasters in Europe and Asia, having them beg for help to the point of giving up their own control. Central America and Canada had economic down spirals that brought them into the fold as well, and he made a deal with Dr. Doom, who had attacked the capital and taken out all the other democratic leaders in America. And then he destroyed Doom after receiving a blast to the face that left him disfigured, just like Emperor Palpatine. He's D-Life the Hulk. This version of Tony Stark is ruthless and powerful, and that is why he's on this list. Number seven, Iron Man Noir. Coming from the Noir series, Iron Man of Earth 90214 had to go all the way to Atlantis to fix his heart problem. What am I talking about? Let's find out. Tony in this reality was an industrialist adventurer. It feels like national treasure almost. We meet Tony and the crew, and they're looking for something called the Jade Mask. This mask that was said to cure any kind of ailment, so he figured, hey, it's worth a shot to fix the old ticker. It didn't work, so some traders then revealed themselves once the mask was found, so Tony and Rhodey escaped and returned to New York. He goes on yet another treasure hunt with Rhodey, this time to Atlantis, because he heard a rumor that this power source could also do wonders to his heart, maybe, perhaps. Tony gets the trident, and again, he gets betrayed. Zemo and his forces were strong enough to kidnap Pepper, and Tony and Rhodes need a new plan. They travel to Zemo's castle, and it's then that it's revealed that Zemo is actually Tony's father, brainwashed by Strucker. And he was also equipped with Iron Man suits because action and adventure. As far as noir storylines go, Iron Man isn't my favorite, but the whole Nathan Drake vibe that Tony has is still quite fun. And also Atlantis. It's kind of weird. Dive in. Number six, Earth X. Also known as Earth 9997, this version of Iron Man hit the pages back in Earth X issue zero. This time around, the human race is at risk due to the release of Terrigen Mists. So Tony decides, you know what, I'm just gonna isolate myself, not being sure how the mist would react, which is a fair point. So in turn, he would wear his armor all the time, then eventually he made an Iron Manor in New York. Super cautious, you know, with today's stuff going on, you can't really blame him. He went even further when he decided it was best to create his own team, the Iron Avengers. I was super paranoid. So eventually Galactus did come along, so Tony used his Iron Manor and distracted the Celestials beforehand. Now during this, Tony lost his life. Some wreckage impaled him, and for the first time in a while, Tony was able to breathe open air. How you ask? Well, he died, and his soul immediately went to the realm of the dead, and that's when Captain Marvel's soul recruited him for an army set to take on death. Which is, first of all, nuts, because even after you die in Marvel Comics, you can't just chill out in heaven. You have to like go fight another war immediately. Like, come on. But death did eventually die, and that's when Tony got another huge upgrade in Paradise. Using the High Evolutionary's devices, Tony was changed into this angelic being, of course, still with wings. And he looked like Iron Man, so that's fun. You can customize your own angel outfit once you get up there. That's good to know. Number five, 
Tony Doom. Since What If is currently dropping weekly episodes on Disney Plus, we have to mention one of the more wild issues. What if Tony Stark had become Doctor Doom? It would probably be pretty bad. Yeah, yes it is. So here in the storyline that both of them go to the same college instead of Reed Richards being Victor's roommate. So now it's Tony. Two geniuses in one dorm. Sounds like they would make dreams come true, but in reality it was a living nightmare waiting to happen. Doom tricked Tony into switching bodies Freaky Friday style. And on top of that, Tony's memories were also wiped. So Tony in Doom's body gets in heat for the experiment and in turn, he gets sent back to Liberia. Meanwhile, Doom is in line to take over Stark Industries. He still is Tony Stark, so down the road, Doom Industries was now a competitor to Stark Industries. He's brilliant in any way. The pair end up creating their own armors. Of course, Tony builds a red and gold Doom armor while Doom makes a green and gray Iron Man armor. I'll give you a second to absorb that. There we go. It's a fun little swap with good action, but it's a little bit too confusing of a Freaky Friday type plot. But it's worth a shot. Go give it a try. Number four, Dead Man Walking. We look now over to Fantastic Four The End, released in 2007. Most of Tony's story here was the same, but during the Mutant Wars, Tony lost his life. Now, he didn't get redirected to a paradise where he would then become an Iron Man themed angel. Instead, he uploaded his subconsciousness into an AI. So now he lives through his armors, just swapping back and forth, walking around, which sounds like a solution, I guess, but living forever? Come on, Tony, I don't think that's a way to go, really. Number three, Steel Corpse. Tony and his suit have always been so close, it's had its back many times, sometimes even acting for itself and making a judgment call. Like in Iron Man 3, it literally woke Tony up from a nightmare aggressively. We love that future tech. But in the Age of X storyline, the suit literally has his back as Tony and the suit begin to merge. Ooh, I'm itchy just reading this. This started right after a virus began taking its toll on Tony. He was rapidly declining health-wise, so we chose a more fitting name, Steel Corpse, to be kind of funny, but also he looks like a corpse. So he's like, nah, I'm just gonna admit it. He, alongside other much healthier Avengers, were tasked to take down mutants, but when the gang got there, they of course opted to save them instead. Superhero twist of logic, we love it. Only Tony's advanced suit wasn't exactly on board with his new plan, and it started to act out by itself. It still wanted to save the day, although this was not the right way to do it. Captain America had no choice but to end the life of Steel Corpse in order to save the mutants. Number two, Iron Goblin. Making his first appearance in the Spider Island series, Iron Goblin wasn't made through any reality warping or anything like that. Instead, this happens during the resistance assault on Spider Queen, which is sounding crazier than what I just said. Tony Stark ends up getting captured and infected with the spider virus. He's going nuts at this point, so the rest of the heroes try and snap him out of it by using Goblin Formula, which is a solution, I guess, I don't know, read a book, read a comic book, Avengers. It's gonna, something bad's gonna happen. So he went from being a spider monster to Iron Goblin. Pretty crazy 24 hours for Tony. Tony was still Tony after this point though, despite the evil green look on his face. Like he even said Norman stole his armor before, so he was just evening it out. Haha, <laughs> he's funny. He's still Tony. Nice. But as time went by, every minute that passed, that formula started to in fact change Tony. Like for example, he was flying around on the glider, although he can fly with his suit. It's not looking good. He knew he was going insane, so he sacrificed himself when the Queen's army attacked. Still a hero nonetheless, although he's mean and green and throwing pumpkin bombs. And finally, number one, Iron Hammer. Coming from Warp World, Iron Hammer, aka Stark Odinson, first came to life in issue three of Infinity Wars. So when Gamora had the Infinity Stones, she trapped everybody's soul in the Soul Gem and then folded the universe in half, which resulted in all of our heroes merging together. Pretty fun. So rightfully referred to as Warp World, we soon get to meet Soldier Supreme, Ghost Panther, Weapon Hex, and Iron Hammer. Stark Odinson in this pocket universe is the son, of course, of Howard Odin, chieftain of Asgard. He has the Iron Hammer armor, and of course he has a massive literal hammer of the gods to get the message across. Being a combination of both, he can face powerful villains like Stain Odinson, who is a blend of Loki and Obadiah Stain, and even Madame Hell, one of the coolest looking versions definitely, and also one of the more powerful, a great note, to end on. Kicking off the list at number 10, Anthony the Vampire. Making his first appearance in Ultimate Avengers issue 14, Anthony was the greatest vampire hunter who ever walked this earth. He trained Daredevil, Blade, and Edward Cullen. Okay, the last one I lied about, but still, you get it. When he meets up with Blade later on, he has a new look. He was eventually bitten by a vampire, so he became their leader as well. The coolest part about Anthony is that he uses a Mark I Iron Man suit to get around during the day, so the sun doesn't, you know, evaporate him or whatever. He captured and turned Smart Hulk into a bloodsucker, but his armor was stolen and used by Stick to fight back. Another Tony, another suit. Imagine you're in trouble and this guy rolls up on you. What a surprise that would be. Issue 16 of Ultimate Avengers opens with a great Twilight parody, but this is also the last time we see this Iron Man take flight. And that's because Hulk punched his head off, and usually when he does that, you don't come back. Vampire or not. 
Number 9, Iron Lantern. From the Amalgam Comic Universe, Iron Lantern is of course a millionaire who is in charge of Stark Aircraft. While he's working on a flight simulator, it straight up took off and flew him somewhere else. Best simulator ever, if I do say so myself. Then he crash landed on the ground, injuring Stark, and he realized he was brought to a crashed alien spaceship. That spaceship belonged to none other than Roman Sir, who died before getting a chance to talk to Hal Stark. Not being in the best condition, obviously, after the rocky landing, Hal started working with his newfound tech on a new suit hopefully to save his life. The Green Lantern upgrade of a suit saved his life for sure, but it also gave him the power to create anything out of green energy. He used a battery that reminded him of a lantern to do so. And then he went on to fight the aliens that had shot down Roman Sir and continued fighting enemies such as Madame Sapphire and Mandranesto, who yes, you already know exactly what I'm talking about. Before we continue on with this list, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be great. It really helps us out here quite a bit. You're the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get right back into this list of weird Iron Mans. Number 8, Lord Iron. Coming from Marvel 1602, Lord Iron was amongst the other heroes who rose to fame, but a little bit back in time. See, Captain America was literally shot back in time, so the age of heroes has to begin there. And in turn, we get some fun versions of our Avengers. Anthony Stark was taken and held captive in the Holy Land during the English and Spanish War, a little different than the cave that he ended up with in our time. He was forced to make weapons still for them for weeks, mirroring Tony's origin in a fun, older way. David Banner was torturing him this time around, though, so Anthony makes his own suit powered by lightning bottles. Okay. Now it doesn't matter which timeline Tony ends up in, he's destined to be Iron Man one way or another. Number 7, Earth 928 Iron Man. Earth 928 is widely accepted as the main continuity for Earth 2099. This is the same one that Miguel O'Hara, the main Miguel anyways, aka Spider-Man 2099 hails from. The sad reality is that in this continuity, there isn't really a future Iron Man to speak of. What we do learn about Tony Stark's future here is that the doom of 2099 has dealt with Stark technology before, and that there is basically no alternate Iron Man within scanning distance of Flipside. Flipside appears in Spider-Man 2099, issue number 29, from the 90s, and appears to be scanning for copies of heroes of old, so that it can basically copy their traits and abilities, adopting them to become a copy of them itself. Instead of running into any Earth 928 Iron Man though, Flipside ends up running into Miguel and becomes a copycat of Spider-Man 2099 instead. So like I said, as far as we know, there is no Iron Man 2099 in the main 2099 reality. There was a future for Tony, but we don't really know about it. We just know that he was there until he wasn't. Number six, Stark Fujikawa. While Iron Man of Earth 928 appears to be dead, there is also the existence in this future of the Stark Fujikawa organization, one of the main corporations that rules over the future Earth, along with such powerful companies as Alchemex. While Tony Stark is not among the powerful heads of the company and is not the future CEO, presumed to be dead on Earth 928, in the alternate 2099, future reality of Earth 96099, Iron Man's likeness, at least, does live on. In this reality, Iron Man's likeness is used in advertising for the Stark Fujikawa organization, implying that Tony's future was somewhat tied to the company. At least, like I said, in this alternate 2099 reality, which isn't the main 2099 reality, but yeah, there are lots of alternate 2099 timelines. It's confusing. Although once again, we still don't really know the fate of Tony Stark even here, where his name and likeness still seem to reappear, but the rest is a mystery. Number 5, Iron Man 2099. There are actually multiple Iron Man 2099s out there, but one of the most well-known ones is Dr. Sonny Frisco, who first appeared in the 2015 Secret Wars event, making his very first appearance in Secret Wars 2099 issue number 1. Well, 2099 is a future reality that has been around for some time in the comics. Dr. Sonny Frisco wouldn't appear until later in its continuity, or a continuity really. This also once again is not the main 2099 continuity. In fact, the 2099 reality actually has multiple different continuities. As I said, it's a lot, it's confusing, but just stick with me here. Frisco's Iron Man hails from one of the fringe continuities known as Earth 23291. Sony Frisco, however, would later become displaced to the reality of Earth 616, following the destruction and recreation of the multiverse as a result of the Secret Wars event. Like Tony Stark of Earth 616, Frisco is also a genius who built his own suit of armor and was a member of the 2099 Avengers originally brought together by the CEO of Alchemex, Tyler Stone. At least, you know, in that alt 2099 reality. Number 4, MC2 Tony Stark. In the alternate reality of Earth 982, known as MC2, and not to be confused with the 2099 reality of Earth 928, even though those numbers are 
very similar, Iron Man ends up retiring. This Tony has a life similar to his 616 counterpart in most ways, with only a few differences between them. Namely, that Tony Stark in this reality decided to retire after an epic battle on an alternate Earth, which claimed the lives of many of his friends and fellow heroes, and left Scarlet Witch in a comatose state as a result of her sealing the portal between those two worlds. This devastating battle prompted Tony to retire, although he would seek out someone to carry on his legacy before doing so. Number 3 Mainframe This is that legacy character for Tony Stark of the other main future reality for a 616 known as MC2 Earth 982. Here in this reality, Tony Stark creates his own protege to carry on the Iron Man legacy, using his brain patterns or brain waves blended with an android modeled after his own armor. This android would be known as Mainframe. Mainframe was one of the original members of the MC2 Future Avengers team, editorially known as A Next, after the name of the comic series that the team appeared in. Mainframe initially was much more by the book as a hero, pretty rigid in their ways. Over time, however, the android would learn to loosen up somewhat and even be considered a close friend to many of his heroic colleagues on the superhero team. Number 2 Andros Stark Andros Stark is another Iron Man who hails from the 2099 reality. Not the main 2099 reality, though. <laughs> Ugh, so many alternate timelines. This version of the alternate future Iron Man is actually Tony's grandson, Andros. Andros travels back in time in an attempt to stop his grandfather from creating Vortex. Vortex was initially created by Tony to protect humanity, but ended up turning on humankind instead, infecting the internet and threatening the existence of all human life on Earth in the future. However, in a strange twist, Andros actually ends up learning during his journey back to the past that it was his jaunt back in time that would actually result in the creation of the Vortex virus. The future crisis ends up being averted thanks to this revelation, but unfortunately it also causes Andros to uh, cease to exist. At least this specific version of Andros who traveled back in time. There could very well still be an Andros out there somewhere in the world, one who, you know, didn't have a reason to travel back thanks to the future being saved. This future version of Iron Man 2099 does not appear in the comics, but instead is from the animated series Iron Man Armored Adventures. Number 1 Dr. Anthony Stark Coming full circle now, from 10 to 1. As I said, what if Sorcerer Supreme Tony Stark is not the only one out there? There's also the 2099 AD alternate future Tony Stark, who also ends up as Sorcerer Supreme, known as such, or sometimes as Doctor Stranger or Doctor Anthony Stark. Although, once again, although this is 2099 AD, this is not the main 2099 reality, this is another splintered continuity. This future version of Tony shows up in Infamous Iron Man when Doctor. Doctor Doom as the aforementioned infamous Iron Man appears into the future. However, this future version of Tony would also appear initially in the 2014 all new X-Men annual where Tempest would run into him when she attempted to return to the reality where her husband and daughter existed. However, Stark would inform her that this reality no longer existed and he would actually urge Tempest to return to her original timeline, the continuity of Earth 616. Number 10, Rogers. This alternate version of Captain America resided in Earth 311, the 1602 reality, but initially came from the dystopian future reality of Earth 460, where Purple Man aka Kilgrave had become president for life. As such, Purple Man had seen Captain America as one of the last remaining threats to his dictatorship, and rather than make a martyr out of him through execution, he sent him back into the past, displacing the hero. Captain America took a new identity in the reality of Earth 311, adopting the name Rogers, and used his opportunity to warn the First Nations peoples of the Americas of the risk posed to their existence by the settlers who would come. As Rogers, during his time on Earth 311, Captain America helped maintain peace between the indigenous peoples of the land and the Roanoke colony settlers. In this reality, Roanoke also never disappeared due to the fact that they had Rogers there to help them survive the harsh environment of their new home. Number 9 Iron Man The bullet points version of Steve Rogers never became a super soldier. Instead, he joins Project Iron Man during World War II, becoming the first Iron Man in history. In order to become this new mechanical hero, he has to become surgically grafted to the suit. He would then fight during World War II and later retire but be called back into action to take on the Hulk, who in this reality was Peter Parker. As in most realities, Steve, even as Iron Man, is really no match for that hulking behemoth and ends up dying in battle against him. And friends, 
friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list, if you want more lists like it, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Age of X. This version of Captain America was kind of a villain, although it wasn't entirely his fault. He was led to believe that in order to protect the world, he and his team of Avengers would have to take out and defeat all of the mutants, which included Cap hunting down not just all kinds of mutants, but all ages of mutants as well, if you pick up what I'm putting down. This Captain America mowed down tons of mutant kind with a gun, including Mystique, who was guarding mutant children. Fortunately, Mystique with her dying breath causes Captain America to question his mission and doubt that his objective is truly noble. He decides to go against orders and instead fight alongside the mutants working to protect them. Cap dies a hero, taking on the Hulk, who decides to stick with the mission, calling Steve a traitor. Once again, another reality where it's Cap versus Hulk and Hulk just destroys Cap. Number seven, Shannon Carter. Spider Girl, May Parker's timeline, otherwise known as Earth 982, presented a brighter future for Marvel than the world of 2099 suggested. In the MC2, Sharon Carter's cousin, Shannon Carter, idolized Captain America as she grew up. Now, as an adult, Shannon worked as a tour guide for the Avengers Mansion, but eventually she pushed herself to her physical limit, created miniature Captain America shield weapons, and she was invited to join the next generation of Avengers. Shannon took on the American Dream persona, in tribute to Cap, but when she finally met and saved her idol, Steve was so impressed that he gave Shannon an indestructible shield too. So while she did have a different name, she was ultimately another version of Captain America, and an alternate future version too. She also kicked butt, so does that. Number six, Danielle Cage. On Earth 15061, Danielle Cage, the daughter of both Luke Cage and Jessica Jones, would eventually grow up to become the Captain America of her time. And well, let's think about this. The subsonic flight and superhuman longevity of her mother, with the bulletproof skin of her father, plus the superhuman strength, durability, stamina, speed, and healing factors of both of them? Yes, Danielle Cage doesn't just use the shield of Captain America, she is the shield, and she is an awesome Captain America. She arguably does not even need her shield, which is a controllable drone replica of the original. Unfortunately, we don't really get to see much of this version of Danielle Cage, but we know Danielle is a force to be reckoned with, and as such, she's a Captain America who deserves to be on this list. Number five, Mutant X. The Captain America of Earth 1298, first appearing in Mutant X number 15 in 1999, was a mutant with no name who took on the role after Steve Rogers was brought to an end by a sentinel attack. His past was unknown except for the fact that he was experimented on by the government due to having latent mutinacy. This captain wasn't exactly stable. He lacked control over his mutant powers, which resulted in him accidentally ending the lives of both the six and most, if not all, of the Avengers. What were his powers though? This Cap was still given the Super Soldier Serum, which I'm assuming gave him all of the same powers as Steve Rogers, but his mutant abilities included the ability to increase his mass and strength, telepathy, force field generation, crazy energy based powers, and near invulnerability. His abilities activating caused enough of a galactical upset that it woke the Beyonder, who was sleeping inside the the planet's core. So yeah, he went rampaging and was a total psychological mess, but that doesn't change the fact that he was absolutely very powerful. Number four, 2099 Captain America. First appearing in 2099 Manifest Destiny, this Captain America was frozen again after a war happened that ended the heroic age in his timeline. He was brought to Alchemax and after being thawed out, he told Miguel O'Hara all about it. Now this Captain America was eventually given Thor's hammer Mjolnir to symbolize the beginning of a new world. That's right, it's an official Thor cap. Alongside Miguel O'Hara, Captain America assembled the various 29 heroes into a new team of Avengers and led them into a battle in space against the President Doom of 2099. Yes, he does look like a very 90s amalgamation of the two characters, but his power was nothing to scoff at. Neither was the inspiration he fired up in people's hearts. Definitely a fantastically powerful alternate future version of Captain America. Number three, another 2099 cap. But wait, there's more! In Marvel 2099, Captain America was a female named Roberta Mendez or this version of Captain America was. Roberta was a bit different from most other captains on this list. Instead of joining a government sponsored research program, Roberta was forcefully given the super soldier serum by her husband, Harry. She gained all the powers afforded to a super soldier and she did indeed become a new Captain America, although she was under the control of the Alchemax Corporation, which is a massive science-based company in this future world. It 
kind of gets worse for Roberta as she is actually completely unaware of her separate Captain America persona thanks to brainwashing. Luckily she did actually eventually rebel against Alchemax and then legitimately became Captain America, taking on the ideals that made her predecessor, or predecessors, I guess, so much better. Number 2, Earth X. Captain America in the not too distant alternate future of Earth X was a bit more tragic. In this world, everyone was exposed to Terrigen Mists, giving everyone powers and sort of denying the need for superheroes as much. On top of that, this Cap felt unworthy as he had actually separated the Red Skull from his head using his shield in an act of vengeance, causing him to step down from the Avengers out of shame. There's reason to believe this likely led to all the Avengers except Vision being defeated by Absorbing Man. So this Cap was a faded version of what he could could have been, but he still had all the same powers and abilities and still fought against what was wrong and stood for what was right. He helped defeat an evil telepathic kid called the Skull and helped Marvel create a paradise for deceased heroes. Although he did pass away, this cap turned into one of Marvel's avenging hosts, which were basically angels in the realm of the dead. He became an avenging angel, which is like a title I kind of hope to possess one day, but I probably won't. But His wings enabled him to fly. He could change his shape, but usually just look like his usual self. He was able to travel between the dimensions of the land of the dead to paradise and from paradise to the antimatter sun of the negative zone. On top of that, Cap could also awaken the latent memories of those in the realm of the dead with a single touch. He also wielded this extremely cool sword, but we don't really know what its capabilities are. So, he is a much different Captain America with an extremely unique set of powers and abilities, but he's also one of the coolest. Number 1, James Newman. In 2007's Marvel Knights Captain America The Chosen, Steve Rogers' Super Soldier Serum wore out after all the powerful and intense wars and battles he had been involved in over his unnaturally long life. He returned to his true self and became a mortal again, growing old. Now, Rogers volunteered to use an experimental machine that would let him project his image remotely onto battlefields around the world as an inspirational figure to give soldiers hope and courage. And it did just that for the central hero of this comic. James Newman. He was inspired to do incredibly heroic and courageous stuff, even if he felt like he was kind of losing himself. After Steve Rogers' actual death, Steve's spirit possessed James during an incredibly intense firefight and fought in battles for as long as his country needed him, saying that his spirit was inside anyone who needed him. This one's a bit more idealistic, but it does perfectly represent Captain America and his ideals. Number 10, Jonathan Walker. US agent might be a hero now in the comics, but when he started out in the 616 continuity, he was manipulated into becoming a villain. Jonathan Walker was initially known as antagonistic hero Super Patriot, who did his best to discredit Captain America, claiming that he himself stood for the United States' true ideals. As a result of Red Skull's meddling and manipulation, he was appointed to replace Steve Rogers as the new Captain America after Rogers stepped down as the government actually owned the title and refused to let him keep the title if he wasn't going to be working for them. As Captain America, Walker took a very extreme and violent approach that put him into direct conflict with Rogers, who was currently going by the mantle of the Captain. In the end, the Captain defeated Walker, and after Skull's involvement in the ordeal was revealed, the two ended up teaming up to take him down, starting off on Walker's path to redemption as hero US agent. Number 9, Cap Wolf. Werewolf Captain America isn't as much an alternate version of Cap as it is a a distinct moment in Cap's history where he happened to be transformed into a werewolf. Captain America ends up becoming a werewolf while on the trail of Colonel John Jameson who had gone missing. Captain America himself had reason to suspect that something awful had happened to Jameson who it seemed may be plagued by his wolf side once more. Jameson was known in the past for operating as man wolf. It seemed as though a wolf like creature or werewolf was responsible for a series of murders. In the end, however, Cap's trail ended up leading him into a much more complex and disturbing plot where a villain was attempting to use a recreated werewolf by night wolf serum to turn people into werewolves. Captain America became one of their victims and for a time became a werewolf himself. Granted, he was still a hero at this point, but werewolves in general are considered to be somewhat uncontrollable monsters who are at least occasionally ruled by their own bloodlust. So I think we can at least partially count Cap Wolf. Also, I needed to complete the monster trifecta. 
And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Captain America lists, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8. MCU US Agents In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, US Agent John Walker accidentally becomes an evil version of Captain America without really intending to do that. Really, it's more complicated than him just being straight up evil as it is with most Marvel Cinematic Universe antagonists. Walker really wants to do right by the Captain America mantle and do it justice. He's a soldier who has worked super hard to earn this title, but also, although his heart might be in the right place, that doesn't mean that he knows the best way to approach replacing Cap or doing right by his legacy. Walker ends up becoming misguided as a result of dealing with so much disrespect from those around him, and as a result of him not being you know, as powerful as Cap would be because he doesn't have the super soldier serum. He realizes that being chosen and respected as the new Captain America by the government doesn't necessarily mean that the people of the United States will also respect you, nor that Steve's actual allies and friends will respect you as his replacement either. After he loses his own best friend, Lamar Hoskins, he becomes completely fed up with trying to figure out how to do what's right and instead decides to do what he feels needs to be done. This makes him much more violent and much more dangerous, turning him into an enemy of Falcon and Winter Soldier and leading the government to later on remove his title, his honors, and basically just overall dismiss him. Fortunately, the US agent still found a place on what will likely be either the MCU Thunderbolts or Dark Avengers team. TBD. Or at least to be declared, if not to be determined. And it's Seven Soldier Supreme. After acquiring the Infinity Stones, Gamora harnessed their power to trap the souls of the universe within the Soul Gem. To further subdue the inhabitants, she folded the universe in half, causing every soul to merge with another and giving rise to the Warp World, a pocket dimension where history was rewritten and adapted to accommodate the fused beings. Basically, like the Marvel vs. DC, but just with Marvel characters. Within Warp World, Doctor Strange and Captain America were combined, forming the enigmatic Soldier Supreme. In this altered reality, during the height of World War II, the meek Steven Rogers volunteered for an experimental procedure to become a super soldier in the US Army, but unbeknownst to him, the scientist Morgan Erskine, who presented herself as the creator of the super soldier serum, actually employed a mystical ritual that granted Steven enhanced physical abilities and access to potent sorcery. Following Erskine's ultimate demise at the hands of spies um, from the opposition, because you know you can't say that word, can't say the NA word. Her her true nature was discovered. Although disheartened by her methods, the military saw promise in Steven's transformation and he assumed the mantle of Soldier Supreme. In at 6, Roberta Mendez. Roberta Mendez on Earth 23291 was the wife of Alchemax Operative 1940 and was forcibly exposed to the Super Soldier Serum, transforming her into Captain America. Unaware of her dual identity, Roberta led Alchemax's Avengers. During an attack at her home by the specialist, Roberta transformed into Captain America and defeated him, but couldn't prevent his self death. The following day, Alchemax CEO Miguel Stone assigned the team to investigate Martin Hargood, suspected of hiring specialists. They tracked Hargood to Latvarian Cuisine, where he argued with John Eisenhart, who revealed himself as the Hulk, and attacked the team when they refused to leave. The confrontation spilled outside, where they encountered the Hulk's allies, the Defenders. But yeah, this whole world is, kind of, is, is crazy. But uh, yeah, there you go. That's Captain America for you. Roberta Mendez. Earth 20, just a lot of numbers. Halfway through into number five, Captain Carter. I feel like you're all gonna know this one. Captain Margaret Elizabeth Peggy Carter was a distinguished Avenger and founding member of the Illuminati, uh, the Marvel Illuminati YouTube, relax. Playing a crucial role in the Infinity War of 2018, she fought valiantly against Thanos and aided in his defeat during the Battle of Titan. In the aftermath, when Doctor Strange utilized the Darkhold for dreamwalking, resulting in a threat of multiversal incursion, Carter, along with the Illuminati, voted in favor of executing him to safeguard the universe. In the years that followed, Carter found herself presiding over a hearing concerning an alternate version of Doctor Strange, who was apprehended by Baron Mordo on suspicions of opposing a similar danger to the reality. Before the vote could be finalized and condemn this alternate Strange to death, their headquarters was attacked by the Scarlet Witch, who ended up killing Carter with her own shield and, you know, pulled a science class and kind of just severed her or so from her legs. Um, yeah, very confusing considering how I'm pretty sure Cap has actually caught that multiple times, but I guess it wasn't being thrown by magic, so yeah. Coming in at number four, we have the Superior Iron Man. 
During an event known as Axis, many Marvel heroes and villains had their morality completely inverted, with good guys becoming bad, bad guys becoming good, and so on and so forth. One of the few changes that wasn't reversed by the end of the event, however, was the morality of Iron Man, who in his evil form still possessed all of the intelligence and dark aspects of Tony's personality, and managed to build a shield for himself to prevent being turned into a hero again infecting much of the planet with a new version of the extremist virus and using artificially intelligent drones to assert his dominance, this version of Tony was only finally cured by the Marvel Universe's collapse into battle world resetting his morals, meaning that this was a villain that the rest of the Avengers didn't even manage to properly defeat. Coming in at number three, we have Obadiah Stane, aka the Iron Monger in the very first Iron Man film. It's become a bit of a meme at this point, that many of the supervillains of the MCU are dark reflections of the same powers and personalities as the heroes they're opposing, and the Iron Monger is the origin of that trope in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Completely guilt-free about selling weapons to all sides, Stane is a ruthless businessman willing to do anything to maintain control of Stark Industries, and shows just how awful Tony's new technology could be used in the wrong hands, and what a monster he could become if he gave up on his deepest morals. Although, honestly, the fact that his idea of upgrading the Iron Man suit is just to make the original one bigger, maybe he's not quite as smart as Tony after all. Coming in at number two, we have the evil Emperor Stark. Hailing from the destroyed world of Earth 42777, this version of Iron Man was perhaps the cruelest the multiverse had ever seen, as he manipulated Magneto and the Brotherhood of Mutants into declaring war on humanity, then used the resulting anti-mutant backlash to secure power as the world's only superhero. Holding entire countries hostage with natural disasters and even spreading plagues among his own citizens, this version of Tony declared himself Emperor Stark, taking the cloak of Doctor Doom as a final trophy. This was Iron Man at his most evil, and he was an incredibly powerful threat when encountered by the multiverse-traveling Exiles, only eventually defeated by his own universe's last superhero survivor, Sue Storm. A tragic end for a tragic villain. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have Zombie Iron Man. When Earth-2149 was first hit by the zombie plague that's since been highlighted in multiple Marvel spin-off series, this version of Iron Man attempted to use teleportation technology to escape to a different universe with Nick Fury. However, a zombified Fantastic Four arrived too quickly for this plan, and Tony was bitten, becoming a living corpse inside his metal armor and developing a bloodlust and pure hunger for human flesh. Still surviving even after having his legs blasted off by the Silver Surfer, the zombified Iron Man would go on to lead the rest of the undead heroes and villains in an attack against Galactus and gain this universe's power cosmic, meaning he could now pursue more flesh throughout the entire universe and bring the zombie plague to the rest of the doomed cosmos. Number 10, Steel Corpse. Steel Corpse is definitely one of the most horrifying alternate versions of Tony Stark. He hails from the Age of X reality, that of Earth-11 three to six. Here, Tony Stark ends up becoming infected with a virus that permanently merges him with his suit, causing him to slowly be devoured by it as time wears on. Still, despite the fact that the suit also possesses its own directives and was slowly overpowering Tony's own will, Tony managed to hold on long enough to ask that Cap take care of him when against his own intentions at the time, his suit started targeting mutant children. Captain America did as Tony asked, killing him to ensure the mutant's safety and allowing steel corpse to die a hero. I mean, what more can you ask for if you're Tony Stark? As long as you go out glory blazing, you know what I mean? Glory blazing is not a thing anyone says. Don't say that. <laughs> Number 9, Bullet Points Iron Man. Bullet Points Iron Man is actually Steven Rogers in the reality of Earth 70105. Here, Captain America never became, well, Captain America. Dr. Erskine was killed before the Super Soldier project was completed, causing the government to turn to their backup plan, Project Iron Man. Steve volunteered for the plan, which saw him surgically grafted into an old school and, in this reality, I guess, original Iron Man suit. It was an old school at the time, but. 
retroactive to now would be considered old school. Does that make sense? Instead of becoming a super soldier, Steve Rogers fought in World War II as Iron Man. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, we have a new channel coming your way. What? What? It is called Top 10 Nerd Elite, and it is for the most elite of the Nerd Squad members. So get on over there, hit that subscribe, and check it out for all of the glorious nerd bonus content. We're gonna have so many cool, exciting things coming up on there. I'm so excited. Number eight, Iron Man Noir. Iron Man Noir is the alternate version of Tony Stark who hails from Earth 90214, Marvel's Noirverse. In this reality, Tony Stark is still a genius and an inventor who even back in the 1930s managed to make himself an impressive suit of Iron Man armor. Here, Tony is also an errant wanderer who enjoys going on expeditions and adventures to hunt down lost artifacts. Along the way, he makes some powerful allies and learns dark truths about his family. Number 7, Ultimate Universe Iron Man. Having your mind and body altered by an infinity gem sounds like it could go anywhere. But fittingly for Tony Stark, it led to him being able to physically and mentally interact with pretty much any computer ever. And that's a pretty good ability for someone who flies around in a technological suit of armor. The Antonio Stark of Earth 1610 or the Ultimate Universe has basically become part man, part machine. Kind of like Cyborg, but not really. Being able to project his mind into computers and androids allowing him to be nigh unkillable proven when the master, aka Reed Richards, of this universe seemingly brought his demise but he became a non-physical entity which could manifest itself via computer systems. When actually physically inhabited Inhabiting an Iron Man armor, he gains the usual abilities, plus force fields and cloaking. But he's also got nanites in his bloodstream that he uses to control his suits, as well as open locks, diffuse little boom booms, and interact with all forms of technology before he gets infused with an Infinity Gem and becomes super cool. Number six, Iron Hammer. The Iron Man from the 2018 comic book event Infinity Warps blended the characters of Iron Man and Thor to make for one of the most powerful versions of Tony Stark ever. For some back story, this warp world was created when Gamora gained the power of the Infinity Stones and she used them to fold the universe in half, merging souls together creating amalgamated heroes like Stark Odinson. This awesome version of Iron Man and Thor enjoys virtual immortality thanks to his Asgardian physiology, along with superhuman strength and endurance. His hammer, Mjoln Iron, I know, stupid name, just go with it, has all the same powers as the regular Mjolnir, but it also grants Stark his armor, which is now a mystical suit of Asgardian armor that does all the same cool things. Since both Thor and Tony kind of had daddy issues, this version of the mix also has their father, Howard Odin, playing a big part in the story too. It's just really awesome. Okay. Number five, Iron Maniac. Coming at us from the alternate Earth of 5012, the Iron Maniac shows readers what a totally evil version of Tony Stark would look like, other than the Exiles version. That one's also really evil. This Tony Stark from this war torn version of the Marvel Universe has done some truly horrible things following the loss of so many of his fellow heroes at the hands of a villain named Titanus. Using a really cool armor that also somewhat resembles Doctor Doom's armor, the Iron Maniac went against against the Fantastic Four and even took the life of Johnny Blaze in his native universe. His advanced armor repels some magical attacks as well as generates a neural dampening field that mitigates telepathic and telekinetic attacks to some degree, which really helped him out to be absolutely terrible. Reed Richards of Earth 5012 eventually found a way to send this Tony Stark to the 616 universe, where he faced the 616 Fantastic Four and eventually the new Avengers, showing just how powerful this evil Iron Man actually is and making us thank our stars that normal Tony Stark is a good guy. Number four, Iron Lantern. The Amalgam Universe combined the world's two biggest comic book companies, DC and Marvel Comics, during a time of utmost peace and prosperity. Just kidding, this was in the 90s. This crazy event pitted popular characters from both sides against each other and even fused some characters together. One incredibly cool amalgamation would be between Iron Man and Green Lantern. Harold Stark, Hal for short, was the founder of Stark Aircraft, and while test flying a prototype aircraft, it suddenly took off on its own to a crashed alien spaceship and it crashed itself yards away. The crash left shards of metal in Stark's chest, which after meeting the dying alien, Roman Sir, Stark survived using an alien battery that suspiciously was in the shape of a lantern to build a suit of armor. This armor not only kept him alive though, it gave him the ability to create green solid energy constructs, fire plasma bolts, fly at speeds beyond the speed of light,
light time travel, and it granted him almost unlimited telepathic powers. He also had translation of virtually any language, force field generation, and the ever classic superhuman strength and durability. Yeah, he'll put his hand on your chest, like this. He'll go, stop. Mm -mm. And then he'll fire a little repulsor beam out. Number three, Iron Man and Doctor Strange. So it turns out that Tony Stark is a good fit to become the Sorcerer Supreme. And honestly, when you think about the intelligence of the guy, it makes a decent amount of sense. In What If issue number 113 from 1998, Tony Stark and Stephen Strange meet at a party. And after leaving together, Tony is the one driving when they get into the car crash that would normally ruin Strange's hands. Where in the normal continuity, Stephen has to deal with his hands relatively alone, in this what if, it leads Tony on a journey fueled by guilt to try and repair Strange's hands. Eventually, it leads him to the Ancient One, which in turn leads to him becoming the master of the mystic arts, learning how to infuse his tech and armor with magic to create a much more capable hero. As for Steven though, he becomes almost like Baron Mordo and betrays Stark to Dormammu. Luckily, this isn't a list of better Steven Strange alternates. Number 2, All New X-Men Annual Number 1. But just to hammer home the idea that Stark would make a great Sorcerer Supreme, we actually have more than one alternate reality where this takes place. The second one I want to talk about today would be in all new X-Men Annual Number 1 from 2014. This story showed us Iron Man from the temporary reality number of 591. Tony in this reality brought together the Avengers to permanently end the threat of Thanos on the universe, which resulted in the alien races of said universe rewarding the Earth and its heroes with advanced alien technology technology, turning the Earth into a utopia. Tony himself would start to lean more into his mystical side with all the extra time he had after saving the universe, eventually becoming the Sorcerer Supreme and being able to solve further conflicts without needing any kind of real fighting. Now, last I've seen, this Tony was living youthfully comfortable at 126 years old. There are even more versions of Sorcerer Tonys out in the multiverse, but you can go find them yourself because I'm done. After this number one point, Robert Downey Jr. Look, we can talk about magical Iron Mans all day, but nothing can really stand up to the closest thing we got to a real Iron Man. Robert Downey Jr.'s portrayal of Tony Stark was the whole groundwork for the MCU, and his character in endured for years. Taking aspects of the original character and adding some realism and a really likeable performance made for a version of Iron Man that boosted up not only the comic book character's popularity, but through the MCU, it boosted up the popularity of comic books in general. And for us here at Top 10 Nerd, that is quite a statement. Being in a world that is a bit more grounded and relatable to our own, this Iron Man doesn't have as complex of a story, nor is he more powerful as his comic book counterpart. But he is more than impressive enough without that. Not to mention, he was the one to actually defeat Thanos in the end. His send off from the MCU affected people who don't even read comic books, and I think that says a lot. Number 10, Lord Iron. I will never turn up the chance to talk about Marvel 1602, otherwise known as Earth 311. This Earth takes a bunch of the Marvel characters we love and plops them in the Elizabethan era. And yes, that includes Iron Man. Going by the name Anthony Stark and Lord Iron, his armor is powered by quote unquote lightning bottles and was created when Anthony was captured in the Holy Land during the English-Spanish Wars and treated rather harshly by the Hulk, resulting in the requirement of the suit to survive. Anthony is sent on a mission to hunt down Banner in the New World with his technologically advanced suit. Now look, this suit in comparison to other versions of Iron Man, it's not the most advanced and powerful suit, but when looked at with the scope of the technology at the time, it's centuries ahead of its time, being nearly on par with base Iron Man armors, only it has a super sweet lightning sword. Damn, bro, it's nice. Number nine, original Tony. Technically, I'm talking about a version of 616 Tony here, but this isn't even really like the 616 Tony. Not the one we have now anyways, although at one point this was the 616 Tony. This version of Tony ended up getting amalgamated with his younger self to give us the version that we have now, because this version ended up fighting his younger self. Yep, it all happened as part of the crossing event. Ah yes, the crossing event, what a marvelous time. During that event, it was revealed that Tony was actually a sleeper agent for Immortus, AKA an alternate name and persona of Kang the Conquerors. He is activated and ends up becoming somewhat unstoppable when it comes to the Avengers power to defeat him and Kang. 
Instead, they enlist the help of a younger Tony Stark from the past, who actually almost dies fighting against his older self. In the end, however, Tony has a change of heart, and he basically sacrifices himself to save his friends and the world from Kang. However, as I said, this version of him would later be resurrected and then amalgamated with the younger Tony, who remained in 616 in his place. Together, they would give us the Tony Stark that we know and love today in the comics. Number 8. Exiles Tony Stark, the undisputed monarch of Earth. What? Take a man with the intelligence, wealth, and power of Anthony Stark and make him unbothered by any kind of sense of morality. That's a man who can bring the world to its knees, but has the sense to not let them know it. And then be begged to take charge. Tony Stark of Earth 42777 acquired every world conglomerate. He organized a mutant war against humanity and then defeated their leader, Magneto, created a worldwide famine the likes of which was never seen before, and then invented the cures and vaccines to fix it, and then he got elected president. He developed weather controlling technologies to create biblical level natural disasters in Europe and Asia, having them beg for help to the point of giving up control. Central America and Canada had economic down spirals that brought them into the fold too, and he made a deal with Dr. Doom who had attacked the capital and then taken out all the other democratic leaders in America, who he also destroyed after receiving a blast to the face that left him disfigured just like Emperor Palpatine. He's D-Life the Hulk. This version of Tony Stark is ruthless and powerful. Number 7. Younger Tony A weird fact is that for a while in the main continuity, an alternate version of Tony Stark was actually the main version while at the same time still remaining an alternate. Are you confused yet? Kind of like how Miles Morales is both Spider-Man in the 616 continuity, but also an alternate Spider-Man from outside of that continuity. Even though I know you're all thinking, well Miles Morales isn't like the main Spider-Man, whatever, he's a main Spider-Man in my heart. And that's why this is a little bit different, because this version of Tony Stark actually took his predecessor's place, for a time, anyways. What happened was older Tony Stark, the original version, had been revealed to be a sleeper agent for Immortus, aka Kang the Conqueror. As a result, the Avengers brought back a younger version of Stark to help in defeating the hero turned villain. Unfortunately, that didn't work out great, and younger Tony Stark almost got himself killed. However, in the end, older Tony saw the error of his ways and sacrificed himself, passing the torch on to younger Tony of Earth 96020. Plus from earlier on in Tony's own timeline. This younger version of Tony would stick around on Earth 616, helping to defeat Stockpile, Frostbite, Zodiac, and eventually even Onslaught. After his seeming death at the hands of Onslaught, young Franklin Richards brought back all of the heroes who had fallen, including younger Tony and actually the older Tony from before, merging the two together. So younger Tony really is both an alternate and at the same time is part of prime Tony Stark. Younger Tony, while powerful now as part of the 616 Tony Stark initially mainly fought without full armor, instead often only coming armed with his chest plate and gauntlets, which is why he ranks so low on this list. But he's still he's still powerful. He's still part of Prime Tony. So we got to count that. Number 6, Agent Venom. For a very brief moment, Flash Thompson got to experience what it was like to be Iron Man when he donned an Iron Man suit in order to get in closer to Venom, which itself was bonded with Superior Spider-Man, making him lose control and turn violent. I don't know if we'd exactly consider him a true alternate, as I believe his time donning the armor was quite brief, unless there's something that I've missed here, but it's still a cool moment in a pretty cool story, and so for that reason, we're going to count it today. Fortunately, through using the Iron Man armor, Flash was able to get up close and personal and lure the symbiote back to himself, once more becoming Agent Venom. It was also during this adventure that Flash was also made an honorary Avengers team member. Pretty neat. Number 5. Superior Iron Woman aka Rescue Rescue is Pepper Potts, Virginia Pepper Potts, and the editorial name used for her was Superior Iron Woman. I just felt that name was more in theme with what we have going on on this list, and we already have Agent Venom on here who sadly did not really have a cool Iron Man related name during his brief time in the armor, so I was like, ugh, I want to try to keep it as Iron Man-y as I can. Pepper became Rescue after Norman Osborn took control, leading the S.H.I.E.L.D. replacement organization organization Hammer. During her escape, Pepper found a suit designed just for her, which also happened to have an AI version of Jarvis inside. She not only has her own suit of highly advanced armor, but she also has the Repulsor Tech node, which helps to keep her alive after she also had irremovable shrapnel lodged near her heart. But the RT node also acts as an extra sense, allowing her to feel and interact with various types of energy. It also enhances Pepper's senses and grants her increased strength and overall durability. Number 4. Zombie Iron Man 
Man. Well, you might think it would be hard to turn Tony Stark into a zombie because of, you know, his Iron Man suit always protecting him. You'd actually be wrong. It was before he could get his suit on that he was bitten while working on a teleportation device thought of as a way to save the survivors on their world and basically shut out the zombies. Which makes sense after all. I mean, you want to be light and breezy and not covered in armor when you're brainstorming up a plan and working on tech that, you know, could save humanity. So I get it. Zombie Iron Man, however, would go on to become one of the longest surviving and most powerful zombies in the Earth Z universe, gaining the power cosmic after devouring Galactus and becoming known as one of the zombie Galacti. In the end, however, Zombie Iron Man proved no match for a raging and hungry zombie Hulk. RIP, Zombie Iron Man. Number three, Iron Man's suit. In the 1998 Iron Man series volume 3, we get a story where Iron Man's suit becomes its own version of Iron Man after Tony develops a sentient model. Not a great idea, it turns out. This now sentient suit kind of falls in love with Tony and wants to merge with him. Despite all the warning signs, Stark attempts to continue to use the suit for a bit, but eventually realizes it needs to be defeated. When he refuses to merge with the Iron Man suit, it decides if it can't have him, no one can, and attempts to kill Tony for refusing it. However, in the end, the two duke it out and Tony suffers a heart attack. Due to its love for Tony, the suit sacrifices its own mechanical heart for its creator, giving up its life so that Tony Stark can go on living. The whole thing is pretty weird, but also pretty great. And if not for the heart attack, I'm not so sure how Tony would have actually fared in the end against his sentient suit, because it was pretty powerful. I also love the part where he's suffering from the heart attack, and he's like begging the suit to kill him so that he doesn't die like an old man. I kid you not, that is the thing that happens. If you want to check out the sentient suit story and Tony begging to be killed because he's like, I can't die from a heart attack. Feel free to give issues 26 through 30 of the 1998 series a read. Number two, Iron Man 2020. I know what you're thinking if you've watched part one of this list, but Amanda, wait a minute, didn't we already talk about Iron Man 2020? And you're right, of course, we did talk about Iron Man 2020, but we did not talk about this Iron Man 2020. This version of Arno Stark hails from the Earth 8410, the future. You can tell it's the future because of those sweet gear shoulders on his armor. Just look at those gears. Just check that out. This version of Arno Stark is also a genius who is great at inventing things and is meant to be the descendant or semi-close relative of Tony Stark, but not his brother. More like a future relative. A few times he refers to Tony as his uncle Tony, though seemingly in a more distant sense. It has been mentioned that Tony Stark was his great uncle, though this was before Tony's brother Arno had been established in the comics. So. Who knows how he's really related. Or if he's related at all, maybe it's all a ruse. Number one, Ironheart. Ironheart is Riri Williams. Last time on part one, we talked about another alternate Iron Man from the main continuity who took up the mantle in Tony's honor. And Riri Williams as Ironheart is another hero who also did so, and around the same time too. She caught the attention of Tony Stark and became a sort of young protege and ally of his after she built her own Iron Man suit by reverse engineering it. She had taken the suit out on a test flight and managed to apprehend escape prisoners using it, but damaging it as well in the process. When Tony heard of this, he visited Riri and encouraged her interest in becoming a hero. Riri would then ally herself with Tony Stark during the events of the Second Civil War and also be one of the heroes to take his place after he ended up in a coma following his fight against Captain Marvel. Like Iron Man, Ironheart is also a super genius who has managed to invent and create some really impressive tech, sometimes even without access to the best equipment. Number 10. What if Sorcerer Supreme. In the What If series, we got an issue that explored the idea of what would happen if Tony Stark became Sorcerer Supreme in place of Stephen Strange, and was forced to do battle with the Dread Lord of the Dark Dimension, Dormammu. Oddly enough, this isn't the only alternate future where Tony ends up as Sorcerer Supreme. Maybe we'll talk about that later. It's actually just one of them. Here, both Stark and Strange are in a car accident together, which robs Stephen of his ability to use his hands as a surgeon. Tony swears to fix Stephen's hands, and the two set out on a quest which sets Stark down a path to meeting and training with the Ancient One, instead of Steven doing that. After becoming the Ancient One's disciple and defeating the evil Baron Mordo, Stark becomes the new Sorcerer Supreme and is forced to do battle with Dormammu, who plans on, of course, invading Earth. Stark makes for himself a suit of armor to help him defeat Dormammu, which combines both Tony's knowledge of technology and the mystic arts. Number 9. Iron Man 2020 Iron Man 2020 is both an event and a character. The editorial name was given to 
into a different Iron Man, Arno Stark. Arno Stark, aka Iron Man 2020, was Tony's secret brother and the natural born heir of the Stark family. Whereas it was later revealed that Tony was actually adopted to kind of help cover up what had really happened with Arno and to basically protect the firstborn Stark. Arno would end up taking up the mantle of Iron Man in the future year of 2020. Although now that would actually be the past because it's 2022 at the time of this recording and at the time of the event it was the present because it was 2020, the original Iron Man 2020 comic was actually published in the 90s. So at the time 2020 was very much in the future. So for those of you trying to tell me 2020 is the past, I know but at the time it's the future. In the event Iron Man 2020, Arno takes up his brother's mantle as he fights against the uprising of machines. Tony at the time felt he was more machine than man and Arno basically uses this revelation of Tony's to discredit him, taking his place and becoming Iron Man in his stead. In the end, Arno would basically be driven mad while trying to save humans from machines by attempting to take control of all life, both organic and AI, in order to protect them. Don't worry though, because Tony would defeat Arno and kind of put him in a, a dream state to make him hopefully be uh, happy. Until he wakes up and realizes all of the things he thinks he's been living have been a lie, which will probably not be good. I don't think that's happened yet though. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you are enjoying our content here, why not head on over to Facebook and follow us there. We have lots of bonus content coming your way, giveaways and other good stuff. So go on over there and click that follow button. Number eight, Darkhold Iron Man. The Darkhold Iron Man tale gives us a glimpse into a dark alternate future for our hero. In this reality, when Tony Stark first makes the Iron Man suit, something in his programming basically goes wrong. This causes the suit to remove Tony's skin when it is put on and then removed. Tony learns this the hard way. While working on the suit to try and fix this issue, he feels a compulsion to put it on as though the suit is calling to him. And seemingly, without thinking, he finds himself doing so, eventually even putting on the helmet. The Iron Man suit works to remove Tony's skin and then eventually breaks down his skull and his bones, merging with him fully so that the suit can never actually be removed without killing Tony because now they're kind of one being. But why would he ever want to remove this suit? Driven insane, in the end, Tony Stark believes that the Iron Man suit is actually the way of the future and offers one to every human, turning the population into a bunch of techno organic iron suit human hybrid monster things permanently, including his friends and his loved ones who he also forces into suits. Ugh which would be really terrible because they know what's going to happen. At least those people are unsuspecting and they're just like, ah, oh, free iron suit. That sounds lovely. Let me run into this and see what happens. Better or worse, if you see it coming or if you're surprised by it. I don't know. I feel like if you see it coming, it's worse in my mind. Number seven, Superior Iron Man. Superior Iron Man is actually a version of Tony from the main continuity, but he's so devious and fantastic that I had to include him. What can I say? I'm obviously a sucker for an evil villain version of Tony Stark, as is the second one that I've mentioned on this list. I just feel like Tony has so much potential as an amazing villain, and honestly, I would rather see him as a villain than a hero. I know that might be a hot take, but there it is. And you might even say he's not just an amazing villain, he's a superior villain. Ho <laughs> ho! Superior Iron Man came about as a result of Iron Man avoiding the re-reversal of alignment back to normal near the end of Axis. You see, Scarlet Witch had cast a spell which accidentally inverted the alignment of a good number of Marvel's premium heroes and villains. Well, she meant to invert them, but not all of them. She meant to invert one of them and then everyone else got affected too. Oops. Among them was Tony. When this was reversed, so Tony would go back from being evil to good once more, the super smart Iron Man found a way to shield himself, resisting the reversal back to being a hero. Instead, he remained a villain who simply passed himself off as a hero. This version of Tony isn't just smart, he's diabolical, and his lack of ethics means he's willing to do things that his regular, more heroic 616 self wouldn't. Number 6. Ultimate Universe Having your mind and body altered by an infinity gem sounds like it could go pretty much anywhere, but fittingly for Tony Stark it led to him being able to physically and mentally interact with pretty much any computer ever. That's a pretty good ability for someone who flies around in a technological suit of armor. The Antonio Stark of Earth 1610, or the Ultimate Universe, has basically become part man, part machine, being able to project his mind into computers and androids, allowing him to be nigh unkillable, 
Proven when the master, Reed Richards, seemingly brought his demise, but he became a non-physical entity which could manifest itself via computer systems. When actually physically inhabiting an Iron Man armor, he gains the usual abilities, plus force fields and cloaking. He's also got nanites in his bloodstream that he uses to control his suits as well as open locks, diffuse boom booms, and interact with all forms of tech. This Ultimate Universe Iron Man like quite a few of the other Ultimate Universe characters, is pretty ultimate. Number 5. Darkhold Iron Man As we glimpse into the Darkhold, we get to see into the much darker reality of Earth 21129 when it comes to Tony Stark's tale. Here in Darkhold Iron Man, issue number 1, we meet Tony Stark who becomes obsessed with the armor that he's building, despite the fact that once in said pieces of armor, they cannot be removed, as they bond to Tony in such a way that removing the armor also removes his skin. In essence, we learn that the armor is kind of like feeding on Tony Stark's organic makeup, fully bonding with him. When he wears the helmet, this becomes evident when we learn that skin and bone are melting away, as the suit has, well, no need of them, because they're like, hey, we're armor, so you don't need that. This Tony Stark is eerily powerful as he threatens to take over the world with his technology, offering everyone the infinite and permanent safety of his suits, at the cost of their own organic lives and bodies. Number four. Four, Aaliyah Bell. Kron Stone isn't the only person to bond to the Venom symbiote in the world of 2099. Aaliyah Bell had an injury on her left arm that she got in a terrible accident as a child. Now, as a teenager, the corporation Alchemax had Aaliyah undergo an experimental treatment that would fix her disfigurement. Only, what she didn't know is that Alchemax had actually bonded her with a piece of the Venom symbiote and had intended to make her a super soldier. Just like the Venom everyone loves, Aaliyah pleaded with the symbiote to become a hero with their abilities instead of being a monster and eating people. Venom agreed, but the pair start receiving dark visions of the symbiote god Null still being alive on Earth. <gasps> Number 3. Venom as an acronym Earth-138 is one of many realities that is shown to us in the Spider-Verse event. The President of the United States in this reality is Norman Osborn, who is also still the CEO of Oscorp. And what do you know, Oscorp in this reality also created Venom, as in V-E-N-O-M. like like an acronym, which stands for Variable Engagement Neurosensitive Organic Mesh. So it's a bioweapon, one that President Osborne gives to his lackeys. Even he himself dons the dark creation, so we have an army of venom-powered soldiers led by a venom-powered President Norman Osborne. But who opposes this government venom villain army? Well, this is the story where we get Spider-Punk and all his followers. Fighting for the beliefs, the Spider Army is a group of punks ready to stand their ground Ground, and Spider-Man is their punk rock leader. Unfortunately for Osborne, their V-E-N-O-M is just as weak to sound as the Venom we all know and love, and we are shown this when Spider-Punk plays his electric guitar at full volume, completely blasting away the symbiotes as the two groups clash. Heck yeah. Number two, Earth X. Earth 999, a world where basically every single person has powers. Things have gone apocalyptic, and the daughter of Peter Parker, May Parker, is in possession of the Venom symbiote. While her retired and cynical pops ain't too thrilled about it, she does actually have complete control over the symbiote thanks to her advanced and honed spider sense. She was eventually under the control of this kid going by the name of Red Skull, and thanks to her father and other Earth X classic heroes, she was saved. Venom and her father, Spider Man, go on to join the superpowered police force and fight crime and supervillain threats together. She eventually, after the death of Death, goes on to be recruited by Kang the Conqueror as part of a multiversal team to fight the Apocalypse Twins. In addition to her proportional spider powers, plus the enhanced spider sense, she gains all the usual symbiote powers, plus a few extra, like what seems to be a rudimentary form of telepathy. And tis believed her symbiote could go on to mutate further to gain more powers, which is a good way for Marvel to say, we can do whatever we want with this. She's definitely one of the cooler incarnations of Venom. Number one. Rain. 35 years have passed. Spider-Man is an old, retired man. Mary Jane Watson has passed away. New York is under the control of dictator Mayor Waters and his police force called Rain. But unbeknownst to most, it was actually Venom who had been pulling the strings, taking the position of aide to the mayor in the body of the cowardly Edward Sachs. This version of Venom is much more brooding, maniacal, and downright dastardly than his mainline counterpart, plotting and scheming for years for the eventual return of his rival Spider-Man. 
Spider-Man. Venom is a bitter old symbiote ever since Spider-Man retired, feeling abandoned by the hero, and he cannot wait to get his hands back on him. He has replicated himself thousands of times, put together the Sinister Six, and has trapped the citizens of New York in the city with his security system known as Web, all for the eventual return of his nemesis. All that, and he is still defeated at the end of the comic. Or is he? Number 10, Contest of Champions. Venom is the antithesis to Peter Parker when you think about it. I read somewhere, I can't remember where, that Venom is essentially what happens when someone acquires great power without possessing the great responsibility to keep it in check. And I like that. The two have an epic rivalry, but in Contest of Champions, yes, the Marvel fighting game, fans were introduced to a Venom from an alternate Earth that had managed to finally take down his first host and number one enemy, Spider-Man. He went a little crazy off the victory over his longtime adversary and took the Spider-Man suit from Spider-Man's body and started to wear it around his neck as a tiny little cape. It's almost kind of cute, if not a little horrifying. He is a Venom that ultimately completed his number one goal. He's living life as a fully realized Venom, just thriving. You go, Venom. You go. Number nine, Mech Venom. I'm not entirely sure that this is a future world, but the technology would suggest so. In an alternate reality Earth, 14512, a reality of giant robots and giant Morbin monsters, the armored hero SP4-4-DR, or Penny Parker, fights for peace and justice. Seeking to replicate the success of the SP4-4-DR mech, the Venom, which is spelled V-E-N, hashtag M suit is created. That's really confusing. Oh, Combining a biomechanical sim engine with bleeding edge robotics. Get it? Sim engine? Like symbiote? Nice. Wordplay. <laughs> Ultimately, during a crisis with the Morbius Kaiju, the suit goes rogue, very rogue, and assimilates its pilot, young Addie Brock, plus Penny's Aunt May. The suit becomes a frightening, downright unstoppable threat to the world. Venom is a threat all on its own before it becomes a giant mech suit, so this is pretty bad. Number eight, more robots. Speaking of giant robotic mechs, in Megamorphs, Marvel's seriously obvious attempt to sell some toys, Iron Man recruited heroes such as Spider-Man, the Hulk, and Ghost Rider to aid him in battling the forces of evil using giant eerily transformer-like robots. Each of these giant robots, that also kind of remind me of Power Rangers, is unique to and powered by each hero. Unfortunately, villains got their hands on the tech as well that created the mechs, and a few have their own. Bet you can't guess who has one. Yes, obviously it's Venom. God, this, you read the title? Doctor Doom recruits a team of villains to jump into their own giant robots to fight the do-gooders. And Venom pilots the Spider Smasher, a massive robot similar in style and color scheme to Venom with cool Venom-based abilities. It can also transform to be more spider-like as well. When it first shows up, it does battle with the thing, almost losing before it makes its escape. Number seven, Scream. Scream was maybe one of the most powerful of the forcibly birthed life found foundation offspring of Venom, and I mean powerful just in the overall sense. I say was as well because technically Scream was destroyed by Andy Benton, its latest host. In fact, with Andy, it was also at its most powerful, as Andy could also summon and wield Hellfire, which it would be immune to so long as Andy willed that. Unfortunately, in the end, the Scream symbiote and Andy ended up in a fight against one another where Andy was forced to defend herself using the very same Hellfire against Scream this time as opposed to with Scream. This unfortunately kills the symbiote. While it was alive, Scream's powers were similar to the Venom symbiote, which included the added level up of creating wings for itself and using those wings to fly around, and the unique ability of turning its tendrils into hair that they could then manipulate at will, similar to Medusa of the Inhumans. Also, I just like hair powers. I think they're cool. Number six, Hybrid. Hybrid is the combination of four of the Life Foundation symbiotes, all of which were forcibly created offspring of Venom. Hybrid is the entity that exists when Phage, Agony, Lasher, and Riot come together. Being a combined symbiote, Hybrid has all the powers of the individual symbiotes that make it up. Mostly this means it is power similar to relatives such as Venom and Carnage, but it can also absorb chemicals, produce acid which it can use to attack with, balance the emotions of its host, and can remote control a smaller non-sentient host, such as a dog, while still maintaining a bond with its main sentient host at the same time. Which obviously that's a power that comes from Lasher. 
Number 5 Sleeper Sleeper is the sibling of Dylan and also the seventh symbiote baby of Venom. They are most definitely thought of as Dylan's sibling as the challenging pregnancy that Venom went through to give birth to Sleeper was not something carried entirely alone. In fact, Eddie even helped directly with this birth and it was perhaps one of the first pregnancies that was more openly discussed with Eddie, Venom's partner. Eventually at least. And of course in comparison to the other symbiote babies that Venom has had while with Eddie, which I feel like Venom normally didn't even talk about at all, especially with Carnage. Carnage was like, what? And then later Eddie was like, what was that? <laughs> And I was like, oh, I had a baby. Whatever. Sleeper seems to be autonomous and doesn't specifically need a host, unlike some other symbiotes, especially in those early comic book days. I mean, back in the day, Venom was like, if I don't have a host, I'm literally gonna die. In this way, Sleeper is more of a giver, where their host would benefit more from their bond as opposed to the other way around. Sleeper boosts the abilities of its host and provides the additional power of producing various chemicals, some of which can be used to influence the emotional response of enemies, bending them to their will, making them sleepy, making them less aware so Sleeper can like sneak around more easily. Lots of cool stuff. And technically Sleeper can also kind of use those chemicals to like get a little bit of telepathy going on, which is pretty cool. Number four, Carnage. Definitely one of the most powerful children of Venom out there and one that we can't have a list without would be Carnage. Carnage is much more ruthless than Venom and much more prone to violence, though this is likely because of the influence of this symbiote's first and main host, and often their chosen host to this day, Cletus Cassidy, notorious serial killer. Carnage has proven to be so powerful that on countless occasions it's required both Spider-Man and and Venom, and oftentimes a whole assembly of other superpowered beings to put a stop to them. Even when others think they can somehow control Carnage, the symbiote has proven to be unstoppable and much too much to handle in most cases. Not only that, but even when Carnage turns to the side of good during the events of Axis, they still prove to be super deadly due to how deranged they are. Even when Carnage was like, I'm gonna be a hero, it was still, it was a rough time. Cletus Cassidy inside was like, I don't really know how to be a hero. Do we still kill people? Can I still chop this person up? I like them. I want to chop them up. <laughs> Number three, Toxin. Toxin isn't specifically a child of Venom, but is more their grandchild, I suppose. Toxin is an offspring of Carnage, but is believed to be even more powerful than both Carnage and Venom combined. Toxin has all the powers of Carnage, but is believed to be stronger. Additionally, it is said that they have a more strong resistance to heat and sonic waves, making them a tougher opponent in most cases. While Toxin definitely has a dark side, they can also be reined in, which is what their first host, Patrick Mulligan, tried to focus on helping them with mentoring them and trying to help them learn how to become a hero. So despite Toxin coming from Carnage, they're not inherently bad. Though they definitely do have a little bit of a Carnage streak running through them. That's what happens when you're Carnage's child, I guess. Number two, Silence. Silence was actually what came out of Scream's death. Andy Benton bonded with Silence, believing the symbiote at first to be Scream. In reality, Silence was made out of Scream's remains combined with anti-venom, making it much more powerful in theory than Scream. Technically, it is not a direct child of Venom, but it was made out of the remains of Venom's child Scream, and Venom's sibling, in a sense, anti-venom, known for being one of the most powerful symbiotes around. So because of this, I'm gonna count it as a relative slash offspring of sorts, albeit a very weird, very comic book complicated one. I mean, it's kind of like a clone of Venom's child, but then also like kind of part Venom's sibling. So yeah, I don't know. Number one, Codex. This is technically an alternate future version of Dylan where he becomes a version of the King in Black instead of his dad. Well, at least a version of that on Earth. We meet this version of the character in Venom in the arc prior to the King in Black event. Dylan and Eddie of Earth 616 must team up in order to defeat this alternate god mode version of Dylan, who has become ruler of Earth, creating his own hive mind of symbiotes there that he himself controls. Now, if you thought Null was scary, then you would probably also really love this story featuring Dylan of Earth 1051, known at first as Codex. This version of Dylan would fall under the influence of Null, which was ultimately what turned him dark. Dylan of Earth 616 and his father would help to break the influence Null had over Codex, only for him to fall into a coma and then later be pursued and bonded with by Carnage. Dylan as Carnage in this reality made him even more terrifying than he'd been as Codex. Number 10, 
Yeoman America. Back in Avengers Volume 3, number 2, in January of 1998, Morgan Le Fay's reality distortion wave caused the time period to be altered to a medieval setting, which altered the Avengers' clothing, speech patterns, and thought processes. For Steven Rogers, he became Yeoman America, a knight like soldier with red, blue, and white stars and stripes armor, and weapons including a sword and a more fantasy like shield. Now, to be clear, this is just regular 616 Captain America, but magically time displaced. So he's got all of his same abilities, but something about wearing a suit of armor and wielding a sword like that makes him just kind of better than himself, in my opinion. I don't know. Number 9. Hydra Cap. While this version of Captain America did appear largely in the 616 reality, he's actually technically from an alternate timeline created by a Hydra brainwashed cubic who used her reality warping powers to make Captain America his ideal self. Since she was being influenced by Hydra, his ideal self was a Captain America who grew up being made loyal to Hydra. This Cap would eventually supplant the real Captain America of 616 and would organize the second superhuman civil war as well as Shatowry invasions on the Earth. He got promoted to Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and influenced the legalization of the S.H.I.E.L.D. Act, which gave S.H.I.E.L.D. way more authority. He used this new power to basically organize a Hydra takeover of America, with Steve becoming the Hydra Supreme and bringing on the Secret Empire event. He was defeated by the proper version of Captain America, brought back by Cubic, but this Steve manipulated his way into an extremely high position of power, banishing mutants, imprisoning inhumans, creating a Hydra Avengers team and forcing other heroes into the underground. Number 8. Peggy Carter. If you've seen the Marvel Studios What If show, you know alternate versions of Peggy Carter get the super soldier serum in place of Steven Rogers. Fans love this idea, even if it's strange for a British agent to become Captain America. There are a few different versions of Captain Carter to choose from, but they all generally share the same abilities. There was a version of the character who appeared in Exiles number 3 in 2018 who had a great costume. The one in the Disney Plus show joined the Guardians of the Multiverse, so she was clearly an exceptional version of the character. She's also shown up in a new Marvel Cinematic Universe movie sporting a jetpack and was able to give the villain of that movie a real good run for their money while other more powerful characters were like felled instantly. She can be a bit more hot headed than her Steve Rogers counterpart, sure, but she has the power of fan love. And if you know anything about what that power can do, you know that Peggy Carter as Captain America is very powerful. Number 7. Rogers. Coming back at you with Marvel 1602 yet again, we have a Captain America who initially came from Earth 460. And on this Earth, Purple Man had become president for life, and Captain America was one of the last heroes resisting him, like we'd expect. Purple Man wasn't able to end this Steve Rogers, so instead, he was sent back to the 1600s. Steve now found himself in Virginia, and he aligned himself with a Native American tribe, assimilating himself into their way of life. Steve taught them what he knew about his present time, his language, and most importantly, the near annihilation of the Native American peoples. His arrival and discovery at this time caused alternate versions of other heroes to start appearing in this now alternate timeline. But it also caused reality to start breaking up just a wee little bit. He went by the name Rajaz and kept his origins a secret, being mistaken by the English to be descended from Welsh explorers who reached America before Christopher Columbus. He did not reveal himself until much later when he would be sent back to his time. I love the 1602 story, and I think what Steve becomes falls right in line with his character. He helped the Native Americans to be aware of what the Europeans would do, and he even saved the colonists of Roanoke and became the protector of Virginia Dare. I promise this story is worth a read, just, just do it. Number 6. Cap Wolf In the 616 reality, in Captain America Volume 1, number 405 from 1992, Captain America is injected with a serum by Dr. Nightshade that gives him the curse of the werewolf, giving us Cap Wolf. Now, while he ultimately recovers from the curse, in the reality of Earth 666, everyone is some kind of monster version of themselves. So obviously, this version of Cap Wolf never recovered from the curse and remained a werewolf, becoming a core member of the Undead Avengers. It's a super soldier werewolf. I'm not too sure what the rules on his power levels would be exactly, but I know he's got to be more powerful than a regular Captain America, for sure. Maybe a little bit more feral with a, less of a tactician's thinking, but he's covered in fur, got crazy sharp claws, and I'm sure his bite is worse than his bark. 
God, I'm sorry, that was a bad joke. Number five, it's Venom Cap. With a whole Spider-Verse event, I think it was a genius move for Marvel to create a Venomverse event as well. All the reason I would need is just seeing a whole slew of characters who are Venomized. One of the most prominent would be the leader of the Resistance, a Venom bonded version of Captain America, who first appeared in the Edge of Venomverse number one when he started recruiting alternate versions of Venomized heroes starting with the Venom X-23. And let me just say this Captain America looks awesome. All black, obviously, with white accents. His shield can extend out from his body thanks to the Venom tendrils. But then, the Resistance gets attacked by a poisoned out Hulk. And then Cap and a whole bunch of Venom heroes become poisons as well. And they look dope as heck. But still, I'll take the black and white Venom versions over the poison versions any day. Number four, Bruce Banner. This is a kind of a blink and you miss it moment, which doesn't really make sense for a comic book, but basically in Spider-Man Magazine number four, we get a little story that shows us a Bruce Banner Hulk who seems to have acquired a Hulk-sized Captain America suit, and he also seems to have Wolverine's adamantium claws, and I'm assuming his adamantium skeleton too. He defends the Daily Bagel against Doc Ock and Magneto. But it seems to be a Hulk who has the wherewithal to become this world's Captain America, but he went through the adamantium bonding process that produced Wolverine? That's utterly insane, and I'm not complaining at all. Just wondering when I'm gonna get to see this again, if ever. Please let it happen. I can only assume he's incredibly powerful, but since we don't get to see much of it, this is where I'm gonna put him. Okay? Okay. Number three, Mutant X. The Captain America of Earth 1298, first appearing in Mutant X number 15 in 1999, was a mutant with no name who took on the role after Steve Rogers was brought to an end by a sentinel attack. His past was unknown, except for the fact that he was experimented on by the government due to having latent mutinacy. This captain wasn't exactly stable. He lacked control over his mutant powers, which resulted in him accidentally ending the lives of both the Six and most, if not all, of the Avengers. What were his powers, though? This Cap was still given the Super Soldier Serum, which I'm assuming gave him all the same powers as Steve Rogers, but his mutant abilities included the ability to increase his mass and strength, telepathy, force field generation, crazy energy-based powers, and near invulnerability. His abilities activating caused enough of a galactical upset that it woke the Beyonder, who was sleeping inside the planet's core. So yeah, he went rampaging and was a total psychological mess, but that doesn't change the fact that he was absolutely very powerful. Number two, Major Gamma. The thing I love about comic books, and I've mentioned this already in this video, is that they will come up with just the wildest reasons to give us amazing things we all want. So for example, in the third issue of Tarot, a story from 2020, a set of magical tarot cards representing each of the heroes gets cut in half by Valkyrie and shuffled by the villain Diablo. The cards come back together and as a result, we get amalgamated heroes. Now two of these new heroes are a mix of Captain America and the Incredible Hulk called Major Gamma, and a mix of Captain America and the Silver Surfer named Captain Cosmos. It's kind of hard to pick which of these characters would be more powerful. I'd assume Captain Cosmos, but, but since you've got a Hulk cap, which I've definitely always wanted more of, I'm gonna stick with him. Yeah. Yes, I have included two very different Hulk Captain Americas, but are you really complaining? Because I'm, I, I'm not. And number one, we got 2099 Captain America. We've had 3099 Cap already, but he isn't really much compared to this one. First appearing in 2099 Manifest Destiny, this Captain America was frozen again after a war happened that ended the heroic age in his timeline. He was brought to Alchemax, and after being thawed out, he told Miguel O'Hara all about it. But how is he powerful? Well, this Captain America was eventually given Thor's hammer Mjolnir to symbolize the beginning of a new world. That's right, an official Thor cap. Alongside Miguel O'Hara, Captain America assembled the various 2099 heroes into a new team of Avengers and led them into a battle in space. Yes, he looks like a very 90s amalgamation of these two characters, but his power was nothing to scoff at. Neither was the inspiration he fired up in people's hearts. Definitely a fantastically powerful version of Captain America. All right, number 10 is the Captain America of 3099. Although this version of Captain America is not native to any comic books, he is still probably one of the sweetest looking Captain Americas we have ever seen. He is James Rogers, presumably an ancestor of Steve Rogers, and he wields a shield that seems to be made of pure energy that can do multiple different things. 
It's seen to be able to be thrown and can even turn into a much larger shield that even creates a force field bubble around James. It seems to also be able to duplicate and become multiple shields, giving James protection while other shields are bouncing around enemies. The story reason for his existence is that in a fight between an Ultron under the control of Red Skull and Captain America, Iron Man, and Black Widow, a portal to an alternate dimension opened up, and the alternate 3099 versions of those heroes came through and fought the main ones. I don't care what the excuse is, to be honest. All the versions of these 3099 heroes are sweet. All right, number nine, Miles Morales cap. If you haven't checked out the what if Miles Morales stories, please do yourself the favor. It may not make much sense as to why Miles ends up in the situations he does, but he becomes Wolverine, Hulk, Thor, and of course, Captain America. In the very first issue, Miles' dad is part of the new super soldier program inspired by the original. Uncle Aaron, who always plays a large part in Miles' life, steals the super soldier serum and keeps it in his fridge, which is where Miles finds it while he's looking for a drink. Turns out Miles is a perfect match for the super soldier serum and he becomes the new Captain America. It's so cool. Because not only is Miles the new Cap, but Tiana Toomes becomes the Falcon, and Sam Wilson becomes the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. like with the eye patch and everything. Uncle Aaron becomes Prowler after being attacked by Black Widow, and Lonnie Lincoln is the Grey Skull, which is this reality's Red Skull. He seems to be just as powerful as the normal Captain America, if not a little younger and by extension a little more naive. But he's still cool, so. Number eight, Gladiator Cap. Thank the Marvel gods for creating Battle World. This great amalgamated world gave us tons of different alternate characters and cool little side stories, one of which was Planet Hulk. Captain America and Bucky Barnes fought in a war between the realm of Apocalypse and Greenland, which is a realm inhabited by Hulks. But they were captured and forced to fight in the Colosseum alongside Devil Dinosaur on the outskirts of Doomstadt. At some point, Bucky seemed to be captured by the Red King of Greenland, and the Captain and Devil Dinosaur are sent by God King Doom and his Warden Strange to take out the Red King and destabilize Greenland in exchange for also saving Bucky. Now. That's all the premise I really need to see this amazing story and this awesome Captain America variant. He's defeated a group called the Wolverine Clan, he's got long hair, he's battle scarred, he wields a battle axe alongside his tattered patchwork shield, he's a gladiator, and he fights alongside a giant red T-Rex. I mean... Number 7, MCU Captain America. I find it hard to be able to put most of the MCU iterations of characters into a list of most powerful versions of themselves. The MCU tends to depower a lot of their characters, which I suppose is understandable from like a storytelling perspective. But when this version of Cap wields Mjolnir and smacks around Thanos for a little while, nearly beating him all on his own, a feat the Hulk could not even achieve, and then fights the army Thanos brought with him, all with minimal training wielding the power of Thor, it's honestly a sight to behold. I almost wish they showed us Cap going through time, fixing all the branch timelines the Avengers had created. It would have been so cool seeing the ways he could use the hammer. Like, imagine Captain America flying through the air with his shield in one hand and being dragged by Mjolnir in the other. It would just be really cool. Number six. Danielle Cage. On Earth 15061, Danielle Cage, the daughter of both Luke Cage and Jessica Jones, would eventually become the Captain America of her time. And, well, let's just think about this for a second. The subsonic flight and superhuman longevity of her mother with the bulletproof skin of her father, plus the superhuman strength, durability, stamina, speed, and healing factor of both of them. Yes, Danielle Cage doesn't just use the shield of Captain America. She is the shield. She arguably does not even need her shield, which is a controllable drone replica of the original. Unfortunately, we don't get to see much of this version of Danielle Cage, but we know Danielle is a force to be reckoned with, and as such, she is a Captain America who deserves to be on this list. Number five, Earth X. If you haven't read Earth X, well, do it. But the basic premise is that in this alternate reality, the people of the Earth all begin to gain mutant abilities. And in the words of Syndrome from The Incredibles, and when everyone's super, no one will be. Captain America specifically was a bit more tragic in this story. 
For starters, he felt unworthy as he had actually separated the Red Skull from his head using his shield in an act of vengeance, causing him to step down from the Avengers out of shame. But this likely led to all the Avengers except Vision being defeated by Absorbing Man. So this Cap was a faded version of what he could have been, but he still had all the same powers and abilities and still fought against what was wrong and stood for what was right. But it's when he passed on that he actually became more powerful. Cap turned into one of Marvel's avenging hosts, which were basically angels in the realm of the dead. His wings enabled him to fly. He could change his shape, but usually looked like himself. He was able to travel between the dimensions of the land of the dead to paradise, and from paradise to the antimatter sun of the negative zone. On top of that, Cap could also awaken the latent memories of those in the realm of the dead with a single touch. He also wielded an extremely cool sword, but we don't know what its capabilities really are because he never used it. He is a much different Captain America with an extremely unique set of powers and abilities, but he's also one of the coolest. Number four, Kingpin Venom. Wilson Fisk, straight out of Earth TRN 421. He appeared in the 100th anniversary special of Spider-Man issue one back in 2014. You would think Kingpin obtaining the symbiote for more power would be enough to make you feel sick, but he also had to upgrade it as well, which is what makes this version so unique and I had to include it here. He added techno-organic improvements to the symbiote that gave him access to any and all tech on the planet. You better check those recently deleted photos before going to a dinner party with Wilson Fisk. When Eddie Brock and Peter Parker were duking it out, they both came to the conclusion that the symbiote should just, you know what, be destroyed. It's not helping either party, let's just get rid of it. Great deal, goopy fist bump. But that's when Kingpin came along and kidnapped both of them, and then he got the symbiote. And honestly, Kingpin Venom, when he's chasing Peter down, he's like controlling tech and using it against him. I can see this being a pretty stressful situation for Peter, but somehow, somehow he managed to escape by luring him into the woods and then starting a forest fire. Usually I would advise against forest fires, but it's Venom we're talking about, so burn it. Burn it all, get rid of him. Number three, Don Fortunato. Quite an unfortunato story if you ask me. <laughs> Not really, it's actually quite tragic. Back in 2005, Marvel wanted to reboot Venom, so the new Venom host was now Don Fortunato after he won the symbiote in an auction. Hey, you want a car or you want a life-changing goop that's gonna kill your family? He gave the suit to his son Angelo to make him more tough, I guess. See, Eddie warned about the risks, but Angelo didn't listen. Angelo attacked Spider-Man and ripped out his heart, only to discover, oops, that was just an imposter, because costumes are a thing that exists in real life. And after a fight with the Spider-Man, Angelo left out of fear. Venom wasn't a fan of this, because he's like, oh, you're leaving, I don't like you, you're kind of weak. So he left the host, he left him mid-air. Spider-Man would have swooped down and saved him, but his gear wasn't working properly after the fight he just had with Angelo. You played yourself. Number two, Old Man Logan. We had Laura on the list earlier, so we gotta throw Logan in there too, of course. Coming from the edge of Venomverse issue four, we see Logan get captured by Angel, Spider-Girl, and Hulk Jr., when all of a sudden he's eaten by a T-Rex, the same T-Rex that was Venomized in the original Old Man Logan story. Now considering the fact that Logan was eaten by the Hulk in that story and then ended up ripping his way out, we gotta think he's probably gonna be okay after this. And he is okay, in fact, he's better than ever. The symbiote ended up bonding with Logan inside of the dinosaur, giving us a pretty fun issue. He rips his way through the dinosaur and tears his enemies apart. At one point, we're even given a glimpse of Venom Captain America, but we'll save him for another list. <laughs> and finally, number one, Agent Venom. Flash Thompson first appeared in Amazing Fantasy issue 15 back in the early 60s, and since his first introduction as a classmate to Peter Parker, he's seen quite a bit of change. First starting out as a bully, and by the time he left college, he was joining the military, stationed in Southeast Asia. But he didn't stick around for too long. The American forces just destroyed this beautiful temple that they found, and Flash was having no part of it. It's like Avatar, especially after meeting the lovely Shashan who healed him. He was like, guys, don't do this. We're, let's just go home. But he went home, he returned to America and needed Spider-Man's assistance because the survivors of that hidden temple were now after him because they blamed Flash. Flash didn't become suspicious of Peter Parker being the webhead until much later, in issue 135 in fact. By the time we get to Amazing Spider-Man 574, Flash had returned to the battlefield, this time in Iraq, but he lost both of his legs. When he returned, Shashan was able to help rehabilitate him. Things changed dramatically for Flash when he was enlisted into Project Rebirth 2.0. The government had acquired the Venom symbiote after Mac Gargan's arrest following the siege of Asgard. We break down Mac in part one of this list, so you haven't checked that out yet, you know what to do once this is over. So now Flash has legs again, how lovely is that? And Spider-Man abilities, just to top that off. 
His first task made him enemies with the new jack-o'-lantern. Honestly, I feel quite bad for Flash. Most see him as a bully. He had a terrible father, he got kidnapped by Doctor Doom because he dressed like Spider-Man one day, and he's got terrible luck. <laughs>